In addition, we are receiving presentations and public comment through a Zoom meeting platform. If you intend to present or comment or think you might be interested in commenting, you should already be in the Zoom meeting room. Using the meeting ID provided on the board's website and the password you received from our staff. If you're not already, if you have not already received a password, you can email, you can email us now at, and I'm going to say this and then um, spell it out and you can see it on your screen, agenda5 at waterboards.ca.gov, A-G-E-N-D-A-5 with the ampersand, waterboards.ca.gov. That email address is agenda. And I've already gone through that. Uh, include speaker comment in the subject line so that we can follow up with you. For those in the Zoom meeting, you'll be on mute and your camera turned off until it is your turn to speak. Our meeting host, Gene Coughlin from our IT team will then unmute you and ask you to turn on your camera if you have one. When you're finished speaking and the board members have completed asking questions, you'll be placed on mute and your camera turned off. We appreciate your patience and understanding during this extraordinary time. I'll now introduce the other board members as follows. Denise Kadera of Allensworth, you'll wave Denise. Carmen is not with us yet. Raji Brar of Bakersfield. Mark Bradford of Sacramento. Good morning. Sean Young, yeah, excuse me, Sean Yang of Sacramento. He's the one with the freshman today that uh, is enjoying herself in a new role. Uh, Nick Avidus of Sacramento. And I am Carl Longley of Fresno. State board member Nicole Morgan is participating in this meeting and will give an update to the board a little later. I'll now introduce the executive officer, Patrick Palupa, who will introduce his staff. Good morning, chair, members of the board and state board member Nicole Morgan. Uh, excellent to see you back. Um, uh, today we have uh, Clint Snyder, assistant executive officer in the Reading office on the Zoom uh, call. We have Clay Rogers, Assistant Executive Officer in uh, the Fresno office, and JJ Baum, Assistant Executive Officer in the Rancho Cordova office joining us. Um, Adam Lappitz may join us later on. Speaking of folks with freshmen, he is moving his daughter into her freshman year in college. Um, so that absolutely takes priority over a board meeting. There's not many things that do, but that certainly does. So he probably will be joining us uh, a little later, um, but that's what he's up to right now. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Kelly Garver, um, the administrative officer, and helping out with the technology, we have Bob Chow, Gene Coughlin, uh, we have um, uh, my assistant, Mindy uh, Maxwell, and uh, Janelle Brown, all uh, pitching in to make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, we also have from the Office of Chief Council, Council uh, Jessica Yar, Senior Counsel, Bailey Toff Dupuy, uh, Chris Moskal, and David Lancaster, all uh, attorneys with the Office of Chief Counsel. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Um, Denise, would you please lead us in the pledge? Yes. Ready, begin. Where's the flag? There it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation uh, under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you very much. We'll now move to uh, the next agenda item, agenda item two, board member communications. Are there any communications? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I had some follow-up discussions related to scheduling a meeting with staff with uh, the Northern California Water Association folks. Very good. Thank you, Nick. Any others? Yeah, Carl, I, uh, you and I and Adam spoke on July 12th regarding that letter from a concerned citizen related to the uh, Sacramento City sewer system in McKinley Park. Ah, uh, yes, I got to put that on mine. Uh, July, yeah. That was July 12th? July 12th. Yeah. I think we agreed we'd ask the city for a follow-up uh, status report. Right. After the next winter event. Right. <clears throat> Very good. Anybody else? Uh, Chair, well, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. One thing that Mark reminded me, I had a conversation with a supervisor in Sacramento County about uh, the impacts to uh, water quality from homeless encampments. So nothing. Very specific. good. Any other? Yes, uh, Dr. Longley. Uh, on Friday, June 18th, uh, I participated in a field trip, uh, Sequoias to the SLU. It was hosted by Tulare Basin Watershed Partnership. I'm a, a board member. Uh, the trip included us looking at the watershed, starting with uh, the Atwell Island wetlands, uh, Allensworth area, Pixley wildlife, portions of Deer Creek along uh, Highway 99 on the east, and we traveled the Deer Creek up to the Sequoias. It was quite an enlightening journey, uh, seeing the connection from the uh, headwaters to the lake bottom, and then just considering opportunities that exist to protect the natural course, as well as to educate the public about the need to maintain its natural features. It was um, it's a huge project uh, that uh, Tulare Basin Watershed Partnership is embarking upon. And uh, like I said, it was a, an enlightening experience for me to travel that. I had not gone to the Sequoias ever before. So what an experience similar to many of the things we do when we take our field trips. Um, also Friday, July 16th, I participated in the State Water Board meeting where we discussed our regional, uh, where we discussed our strategic plan uh, with the State Water Board. Uh, Friday, July 23rd, I participated in the Community Water Leaders Network session where we discussed groundwater impacts connecting the uh, GSMA and drought. Uh, some of the future uh, discussions is on the GSA addressing well impact mitigation and which is key to the uh, GSAs to get a plan in place to deal with the water shortages during the times of drought. And then also um, Tuesday, August 10th, I participated in another Community Water Leaders Network roundtable. And this was on the water and wastewater arrears uh, payment program. Uh, Leslie Lawton of the State Board uh, presented the timelines and requirements and implementation for the water debt relief effort. So those are my updates and then you will be discussing the other one. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Any others? Okay. Um, well, a whole bunch of dates, 22, 29, Dr. June. Dr. Yes, yes, Sean, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just a couple of brief ones. Uh, I reached out to the Central Valley, uh, one of the nonprofit uh, organization leader, Longshan, about the Southeast Asian the disadvantaged uh, community farmer. Uh, about our meeting that uh, maybe took place in January or February. Um, he alluded that late January or February might be best for uh, the farmers. Um, that's my communication with him. And in July 4th, I pay a visit to the fire in the Susuku County and have opportunity to speak with uh, uh, the local chief chef, uh, the roof about uh, water issues and visit some of the fire area. So just wanna throw that in there. Thank you, Sean. Does anybody have anything else to add? Not then, I'll go ahead. Um, both Denise and I have been involved in, in numerous meetings with State of California personnel, including a lot of, including folks in the Division of Drinking Water. 
local officials and other stakeholders regarding the development um, of the planning for special districts for both the Stanislaus County area and the Southwest Tulare County area uh, that lies away from uh, a municipality. And the purpose of these meetings is uh, to uh, provide uh, water-related services, including safe drinking water, wastewater treatment, and groundwater recharge to disadvantage to, to DACs that are we're referring to as outlined DACs. And basically, this is a one water approach that we're hoping to take. Um, on 12 July 2021, I participated in a Salinity 5 meeting discussing CV Salt's administrative issues with CV Salt's uh, leadership. Um, on both 12 July 21 and 2 August 21, participated in the monthly regional board's chair's meetings. Uh, 16 July 2021, participated in meeting the State Board and Central Valley Regional Board leadership to overview programs, identify areas of concern, ensure and ensuring joint projects are well coordinated. And um, culminating my activities during this last period with today's meeting. And of course, on 12 July, uh, as I mentioned er earlier, I missed the one on Mark and I talked to a concern together with Adam talked to a concerned citizen about, about their issues. And um, on the 16th of July, um, I was, uh, Bruce Hodeshell called me in, in regards to an item that is on the uh, agenda and we'll be talking about that later. Thank you. John, you're up. Do you have anything to add or? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we'll we'll move on to agenda item three, State Board uh, Liaison Update. And I'd like to call upon State Board member Nicole Morgan to give an update to the board. Good morning, Chair Longley and Vice Chair Kadera and members of the board. I'm excited to be here today as your new state board liaison, and I'm looking forward to working with the regional board again. Let's see. So there are several updates um, today. So the state water board has a drought website, which provides information on regional drought responses, water board actions, financial assistance, and reporting tools. Um, the Please take a look at the website and send any feedback that you have to drought at waterboards.ca.gov. On August 2nd, the State Board issued I cannot talk this morning, sorry, uh, orders for 861 water right holders in the Upper Russian River. Um, down in the Delta on August 3rd, the State Board adopted an emergency curtailment regulation for the Delta watershed. Emergency regulation must be approved by the o Office of Administrative Law and filed with the state secretary before it becomes effective and curtailment orders can be issued. Of the 6,600 water right holders in the Delta watershed, approximately 5,700 could be ordered to curtail diversions as early as this month under the authority provided by the regulation. The remainder who hold older water rights or riparian rights could be subject to curtailment if conditions worsen. Um, on July 16th, staff released a draft emergency regulation for the Scott River and Shasta River watersheds and public comments due on, um, on July 23rd. The comment period end, ended on August 12th, it was yesterday. On August 17th, the State Board will consider emergency regulation um, for adoption. As Vice Chair Cadera um, stated, there is a new California Water and Wastewater Rouge payment program. The State Board is developing the program to distribute one billion in relief to reduce customer water bills as, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And early August, the State Board um, open the survey for community water systems to inform the funding allocation and program eligibilities. On August 19th, staff will 
provide an overview of the program. The um, Division of Water Quality has been working on a statewide registration order and establishes a streamlined permit process for specific types of environmentally beneficial registration activities. On June 30th, the State Board released the proposed order and draft environmental impact report for public comment. On August 4th, the Water Board held a public hearing to hear oral comments. The comment period ends today, August 13th. The Division of Water Quality has also been working um, on an update to the statewide construction stormwater general permit. The permit regulates stormwater discharges associated with construction activities disturbing one or more acres. The State Board adopted the existing permit in 2009, which has since expired and has been administratively extended until the effective date of the reissued permit. On May 28th, 2021, the Water Board released a proposed statewide NPS construction general permit for a 60 day public comment period. On June 9th and 10th of this year, staff held two work public workshops to discuss the content of the proposed permit reissuance. On August 4th, the Water Board, the State Water Board held a public hearing to hear oral comments. Um, the public comment period also ends today on August 13th. The Division of Financial Assistance um, has, um, so the State Board's Division of Financial Re Assistance has been um, allocated 1.385 billion um, for wa water infrastructure funding. Um, this on August 18th, the State Board will um, hold a workshop to discuss this. Um, the item proposes the um, authorities for the Division of Financial Assistance to administer 200 million of the funds, 100 million uh, for drinking water projects, and 100 million for wastewater projects through assistance funding programs. Additionally, um, the item proposes to authorize DFA to transfer 50 million of the water recycling funding appropriated for the Pure Water San Diego's North City project. On August 6th, 6th, the State Board released the draft 2021-22 fund expenditure plan for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. On August 18th, the State Board will discuss the plan at a board workshop. Public comment ends on August 27th. The Safe Advisory Group advises the State Board on Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund expenditure plan and other related safer policies. On July 6th, the advisory group application window opened and August 4th, the um, staff held a safer advisory group workshop. The application period ends on August 31st. Um, yesterday, the advisory group held a public meeting to discuss the needs assessment and the final expenditure plan. So that concludes my um, report. I'll pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, I just say welcome, welcome aboard, uh, Nicole. It's good to have you. Uh, we didn't know who was going to replace uh, Tam, but we are certainly appreciative to, appreciative to see your face. And I was glad to hear you made the comment about the money coming in for water, safe drinking water, and wastewater treatment. I mean, those are some of the things that Dr. Longley and I have been attending meetings for. And it's definitely important uh, to make sure that small systems, uh, water systems and co communities, uh, disadvantaged communities have access to safe drinking water and, and waste, wastewater treatment. And the funding that you spoke about earlier will certainly uh, be something to help in those areas. So appreciate your uh, presentation this morning. And again, welcome. And uh Nicole, I join uh, Denise in, in welcoming you to front of the board in your new role. We're certainly glad to see you there. Uh, likewise, uh, type of thing that uh, Denise and I are trying to do is critical in that a lot of money has been put into small communities in the past that don't have the capability of managing their systems. And what we're seeking is a, a um, an approach that will in fact, make, make those uh, systems 
uh, viable and sustainable over a period of time, uh, for a long, long time. And um, the uh, and and that's a real challenge because um, there have been so many failures in the past. We don't want to see failures. We want to see successes. But thank you for your report. It was a very, uh, very thorough, and uh, we always like to hear about funding being available. Yes. Are there any other questions or comments by board members? I just want to welcome you, Nicole, and congratulations on your new appointment. That's really awesome. Um, it's uh, good to see you again and uh, look forward to chatting with you at all of our board meetings. And uh, again, just super congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo that. Congratulations and look forward to meeting you in person. Frankly, I look forward to meeting everybody in person. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully we get out of this before the next period comes. Um, any further comments or questions? Well, I'd like to join the group and say congratulations, Nicole, and look forward to meeting you in person as well. And thank you so much for your Thor report. Appreciate it. Very good. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll move on to agenda item five, executive officer's report. The executive officer will provide an update on the officer. Perhaps agenda report. item four first. Oh, agenda item four. I thought I was on agenda. Oh, I missed public forum. I turned to agenda item four. Patrick, I am just so anticipating your report. I was trying to get there. <laughs> okay. In fact, we do have some, some very important comments on agenda item four, the public forum. Um, Mindy, I, I see you put up two folks, uh, Vivian Cow and Alex McDonald. Uh, yes. We'll, we'll take Vivian Cow representing uh, Senator Shannon Grove. Hi, my name is Vivian. Um, sorry, I'm not ready for the video portion of this yet, but just wanted to introduce myself and thank you for allowing us to be a part of this meeting. Um, I, I believe it's our first time joining the Central Valley Regional Water Boards um, meeting. So thank you and thank you for the updates. We were just curious to see, you know, just what the reaction is, if any, um, from constituents or anybody that you've engaged with about the um, barring of the water usage, um, you know, the decision on August 3rd. And, and I guess I, I open that to everybody, whether it's the state liaison or to the water board itself. Um, just any reactions you've seen or any, you know, requests or any of that stuff. Well, I haven't had any except that uh, the work that Denise and I are doing are in water short areas. And what we refer to as the one water concept where you consider water, groundwater recharge, um, you you have to treat the water within a within a basin, water basin, as as one water, and recognizing what happens somewhere impacts somebody somewhere else. But uh, Patrick, has has the board received any comments to answer um, to answer? I, I think I think Miss Cow is talking about the uh, curtailment regs. And I think so too. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Sorry, I should have confirmed or clarified that. Yeah. So you know. From our perspective, um, there's very little uh, interaction directly about the curtailment regs. That's mostly directed at the state water board. Um, certainly we have communities uh, throughout the valley that have a variety of different opinions as to um, you know, the health of the rivers, the, the health of the ecosystem and the ability to continue growing uh, crops and sustainable food in the valley. Um, all those issues come together and all have a, a direct effect on water quality. Um, but with respect to the curtailment regs themselves and, and any curtailment orders that are coming through from that, um, I think, you know, to, to be quite frank, I think most people are polite and uh, uh, don't tend to raise such a controversial issue if they don't have to. And since we don't have uh, the regulatory authority over those curtailment orders, I think they uh, save some of their, their comments uh, uh, for the state water board. I'm sure uh, Nicole staff is, is hearing an earful and I know they've received a barrage of comments, uh, but from, for our agency, um, it's very little, you know, it's, it's just kind of the type of thing that comes up um, in, in, in conversations as something that folks are uh, dealing with, but, but not the pointed comments I'm sure that the state board is getting. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh... 
Vivian. Uh, we'll call the next Alex McDonald. Yep. And Alex is with the Central Valley Regional yeah. Board. Yes. Engineer. Um, Dr. Longley, uh, members of the board, Mr. Palupa, I'm here not on speaking on Aerojet or any of those things I normally come to talk to you about. Um, I'm thanking you for a few minutes of your, your time here. I'm taking this opportunity to honor an outstanding individual who's taken from the, the, our water board family way too soon. Um, Tom Pinko served with distinction during his 30 plus years at the Central Valley Water Board. He was an essence of what the water board employee should be. A man of his word, he's honest, and one could never doubt his integrity. His door was always open, even when he served as an executive officer. He was a mentor, an engineer, a lawyer, a musician, a friend, and a teammate, <clears throat> a consummate professional. <clears throat> Excuse me. I missed my chance to say sufficiently thank him when he was here. I will always regret that. Um, it, it, for some reason, my videos aren't on, but if you can see me now. Today is a Friday. Fridays are the days that Tom Pinkos always wore a Hawaiian shirt. I am wearing a Hawaiian shirt in his honor. So thank you for your time. And that's all I have to say. And thank you, Alex, for uh, um, just discussing uh, Tom once again and, and talking about the, the, him as a person and what he and, and what he brought to this board. Are there any further comments? I, I would echo my appreciation, Alex. Um, you know, there, there are role models for, for how this job is performed, um, the openness and the warmth with, with which uh, uh, Tom served, um, you know, rubbed off on all of his employees. Uh, everybody I know speaks exceptionally highly of his professionalism, um, of his generosity, uh, and, and of his compassion. Uh, and in an era um, that was a little simpler for the board, um, but you know, it required a lot uh, of, of, of intellect. And uh, um, you know, he was an extraordinarily capable individual um, that that really helped make this board what it is today. Um, and, and thank you for that memory. Um, you know, I, I, I was limited in my interactions with him. You know, I certainly met him a number of times, uh, um, but a, a truly an inspirational figure for many people uh, who passed through uh, this institution. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, with that, uh, we have, we're ready for the, Executive officer report. Absolutely, and so, uh, Carl, members of the board. Do we do um, the uh, minutes? Do we do the minutes? Approval of the minutes or no? I have no minutes. Okay. Uh, the minutes are agenda item six, Denise. Okay, sorry. <laughs> they're, they're they're coming up. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of the executive officer's report, I'd like to lead off, and, and Carl, have you received the resolution? I have. Okay, I, I'd like to uh, lead off this portion of the meeting um, with a tribute to uh, someone who also had a huge impact on the board, a number of the board staff, on myself personally, um, and uh, really, really is, is being honored here today um, for his service, uh, for his service with the board, for his geniality, and, and really for just being an, an all-around incredible person and role model uh, here at the regional board. I'm, I'm talking about uh, Brian Newman, uh, who recently retired uh, as the head of the UST uh, program. Um, and, and I will turn it over to Dr. Longley uh, for a tribute resolution that will be given in his honor, in Brian's honor. Um, I will say that, you know, when I started as an attorney, there was a couple programs that I was initially assigned to 
Uh, one of them was the UST program. And uh, so I, I cut my teeth learning a lot uh, from Brian about how things worked, about the, you know, the best way to get the job done uh, and to really you know, uh, understand how my application uh, of my legal skills could complement uh, the engineers and other staff that were working at the regional board. And, and I, I'm truly grateful for, uh, for him and for his guidance through that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Longley for a uh, reading of the resolution. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, California Regional Water Board Resolution of Appreciation for Brian Newman. Whereas Brian Newman spent nearly 36 years at the board from the time of his Sacramento State graduation as a civil engineer until his retirement in December 2020. Alex McDonald and Brian were the last two regional board staff remaining from the days of working downtown at 32nd and Ness Streets in a converted Safeway warehouse. Whereas Brian began his regional board service in January 1985, at a time when staff were not relegated to a single program, and he was an area engineer for Glen, Calusa, Nevada, and Yolo counties, regulating leaking and underground storage tanks, or USTs, also regulating wastewater treatment plants, landfills, industrial facilities, and contaminated sites. Whereas Brian was assigned to the UST program in its infancy in October 1990, when the regional board seized area assignments and reorganized into functional units. Brian was promoted to senior water resources control engineer in the UST program in December 1999, when the site cleanup program split into two sections one focusing on petroleum cleanups and the other on solvents and other hazardous materials. Whereas in January 2005, Brian was promoted to supervising water resources control engineer and became the storage tank program manager, a position he would hold for 15 years. With the aid of the low threat UST case closure policy, which was promulgated by the State Water Board in 2012, Brian oversaw the cleanup and ultimate closure of nearly 90% of the UST contamination cases in the region. Whereas Brian spent 36 years with the Central Valley Water Board as a result of his high quality work and outstanding program, programmatic leadership rarely appeared before the board. That was an impressive feat, not appearing in front of us so often. Whereas when Brian started his career, neon clothing was in style and he arrived for inspections in a state issued Reliant K uh, that was part of the Chrysler Corporation bankruptcy bailout that did not have a radio. So staff therefore was not distracted. At his retirement, face coverings were the biggest fashion rage and he had one of his staff borrow a charger in the Cal EPA garage when the electric Ford Focus, which is part of the climate change bailout that they were driving needed to charge to make it back to Rancho Cordova. Therefore, be it resolved that one, the members of the Regional Water Quality Control Board and staff respectively extend to Brian on the occasion of his retirement, our sincere thanks and appreciation for a job well done. And two, the Central Valley Water Board wishes Brian Newman the best in his future endeavors. Signed by uh, myself and by Denise Kader as well, and unanimously you know, adopted uh, at the 576 regular meeting of the Central Valley Water Board. Thank you. And thank you, Brian, for a job well done. I just add, I had a, a long relationship working with Brian on the underground storage tank program up in Yosemite. And he brought a lot of rationality to the whole process um, in a pretty challenging environment. There was a lot of scrutiny over that program and it was a, just a pleasure working with him and getting a lot of those sites closed on a timely basis. So appreciate it, Brian. Brian, you're able to unmute yourself if you care to. Um, <clears throat> well, I wanna thank everyone. It was a very uh, wonderful 36 years and um, I really appreciate the work that the board does and their willingness to listen to staff and uh, <clears throat> proceed. Like I said, this was a, a 
a career that probably wasn't uh, one of a lot lined out when I was in school, but it was very rewarding working on ground tanks and with the board. So I want to appreciate it. I want to thank you all. Um, and like I said, and, and I too will uh, miss Tom Pinkos. Thank okay. you. Certainly. And uh, I think it's amazing you started working in that Safeway warehouse. Uh, I was working in a completely different job, working for the federal government and uh, came down to challenge you guys uh, you weren't aboard yet. That was back about 1975, but uh, it was not the best place to be working, that's for sure. The whole office had to share three windows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, once again, thank you very much for your for your service, and it's been uh, uh, very fruitful, certainly. And what you did with with the uh, UST program is is something to be proud of. Any further comments from board members? Thank you, Brian. And we will move on with the executive officer's report. Thank you very much, Brian. Can't wait to see you when conditions improve in the world. Hmm. We've got a few other awards uh, to be uh, given out today. A variety of uh, superior accomplishment awards uh, for staff. Uh, first up is Katie Carpenter. Is she available? She's in the list. I don't see her in the list, Patrick. See if she has confirmation that. Um... I hear Bob in the background. <laughs> I don't see Katie. I think we'll proceed anyway. Um, you know, it's certainly a little different when things are in person, but I do absolutely want to recognize Katie Carpenter uh, for her work in the non-15 permitting program uh, in the Fresno office. Katie Carpenter is a tremendous asset to the non-15 or waste discharge to land program. Katie's attitude and work ethic, in addition to her in-depth knowledge and, exper and experience with the water board, allow her to take on some of the most challenging tasks that the office encounters. Katie consistently demonstrates her ability to be the lead staff on complex projects and provides thorough review, allowing management to make well-informed decisions. Management consistently receives high praise for Katie from both the public and from her coworkers. Some of the projects that Katie has worked on recently include drafting waste discharge requirements for a pistachio processing facility, issuing a notice of applicability and monitoring program for a recycled water general order and low threat waiver, issued multiple rescission orders, completed a review of a report of waste discharge for a new pistachio facility, processed a CEQA document for a modification to a winery, processed several Public Records Act requests, uh, started reviewing two nitrate initial assessments for the new nitrate control program, handled multiple inquiries related to the CB salts and local agency management programs under the OTS policy, and working with a potential discharger on a new discharge of slurry waste to a limed pond. We are very fortunate to have Katie working at the Central Valley Water Board, and she is well deserving of this recognition. And I personally know that all of the waste discharge requirements that I've worked with Katie on uh, show an incredible attention to detail, um, as well as a really good understanding of what it takes to have an enforceable order uh, that regulates the waste to protect beneficial uses. So uh, congratulations for the Superior Accomplishment Award, Katie. It is well deserved. Uh, next up is uh, Marissa Bosenko. Is she available? I have to make sure to get them on Hi, the Zoom. Here. She is here and she's unmuted. Fantastic. Congratulations, Marissa. This is another one of these uh, 
uh, board staffers, who's a recent addition, relatively recent addition uh, to the board team. Uh, she joined the Central Valley Water Board's Reading office as an office technician in March of 2020, which is a very auspicious time uh, to join the water boards right before the emergency telework requirements went into effect. Despite the challenges of getting up to speed on the office administrative procedures during this period, Marissa quickly dug in and got to work. She completed all the required training, gained a firm command of internal processes, including those associated with document production, ADA compliance, facility management, and fleet maintenance. She quickly established rapport with the State Water Board, Rancho Cordova, and Fresno administrative professionals and took on several special assignments. In March 2021, just one year after Marissa was hired, her only full-time associate went out on maternity leave. Since then, Marissa has balanced the demands of her own responsibilities along with those of her associate, including procurement, IT support, and assistance with hiring, onboarding, and training of new seasonal clerks. Recently, Marissa worked with the board's administrative officer and state water board personnel to develop stepwise procedures and workflow to assist the board's management team in meeting ADA compliance obligations and subsequently helped roll out the plan to the board's executive management group and leadership team. In a little more than a year, Marissa has proven to be a valuable member of the board's Reading office and its region-wide administrative program. She is conscientious, dependable, and well-respected among her peers and managers alike. Marissa always has a great attitude and her program knowledge is highly valued. She is most deserving of recognition for her work and her contributions to the Central Valley Water Board. And again, I know personally um, from talking with Kelly, uh, Kelly Garver, our administrative officer, uh, that Marissa has been that critical link to the Reading office, uh, even amidst all of the pandemic protocols. Congratulations, Marissa, this award is well-deserved. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right. Is Brandon Salazar on? Double check. I think I see his name. Yes, uh, Brandon's here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning, Brandon. Uh, Brandon works in the dredge and fill program in the Fresno office as a water resource control engineer. Um, he started work in an extraordinary year where multiple significant events impacted the program. He approached these following events with a positive attitude and an inquisitive mind. Within his first two months, he successfully transitioned his on-the-job training to a teleworking environment due to the COVID pandemic. The dredge and fill program began implementing new landmark statewide procedures in June of 2020. In the 2019-2020 fiscal year, the Fresno office received a record number of dredge and fill uh, applications, in part due to the new regulations. Brandon managed to produce water quality certifications in a timely manner, all while learning the new program. In addition, new federal regulations went into effect last September that radically changed the process and shortened the time frame that the board was allowed to issue water quality certifications. Furthermore, a staff retirement placed an increased workload on Brandon, who has been the sole dredge and fill staff for the Fresno office since December. In addition to successfully meeting the above challenges, Brandon, on his own initiative, worked to create a GIS-based tool to display key information on dredge and fill sites throughout our entire region. He presented this tool to our other offices and it was well received. This tool has the potential to help prioritize program work and quickly visualize active sites. Brandon's continued willingness to roll up his sleeves and dig into program issues while also moving things forward is very much appreciated. He is frequently looking for ways to improve program efficiency, and we are fortunate to have Brandon working at the Central Valley Water Board. He is well deserving of this recognition. Brandon, congratulations. Um, I look forward, as, as I think some of the board members have noted, I look forward to uh, the day when we can 
meet in person. Um, um, your work has, be, has been uh, highly recommended by uh, multiple staff who worked with you. Your professionalism uh, has been exemplary and I just wanna repeat the congratulations. Uh, thank you guys. Um, I've had a good experience with the Region 5 across all offices. Uh, I was fortunate enough to just get into the, the Dredge and Fill training in Sacramento and I was able to go to, to Reading and meet the team. So um, just again, thank you all. Fantastic. Congratulations, Brandon. Last, but uh, two more, two more awards actually. First, uh, Brittany Elliott. I don't see her, Patrick. I know several staff are also um, streaming this live. So um, here's hoping that that um, is the way that Brittany is going to be receiving this information. Um, Brittany uh, is in the administrative unit of the Rancho Cordova office. And I honestly cannot thank her enough for the work that she's done uh, for uh, the, um, the employment of many, many new staff. Brittany Elliott has worked for the regional board for about two years. She serves as an associate government program analyst in the operations unit of the Rancho Cordova office. In the short time Brittany has been with the Water Board, Brittany's contributions have been invaluable as she consistently produces high quality and accurate work products. Brittany is very approachable and extremely knowledgeable in HR practices and protocols. Brittany's friendly demeanor, grace under pressure, and her excellent work ethic to assist staff in each office does not go unnoticed. In just two years, Brittany has recommended valuable changes in Region 5 HR practices, developed valuable position HR reports, been a valuable resource in navigating the challenging ERPA, that's Request for Personal Action Processes, and offers a great help in updating vacancy re reports, organizational charts, the ERPA tracker, and more all while maintaining an excellent attitude, friendly demeanor, and reinforcing the customer service goal of the overall administrative team. Brittany has made excellent suggestions to the administrative unit on how to improve HR practices, followed through on her workload, and went above and beyond by producing a high quality work product that was both superb and timely. One of the hallmarks of excellence is the unsolicited praise and admin supervisors have received from various staff who have been helped by Brittany. When you are in close contact with many staff, it is important that you put staff at ease as you deal with their personal and confidential information. Brittany accomplishes this with extreme professionalism, making staff feel comfortable as they pass along personal information. Brittany filled big shoes when she was hired to replace Steve Thompson and is creating her own Region 5 legacy. In summary, Brittany's tre tremendous work ethic, ability, drive, and professionalism are assets to the Administrator Support Program and Region 5 overall. Um, again, as many of the board know, uh, one of our biggest challenges over this past year has been hiring the constant um, stop and start with hiring freezes, new positions coming online, a slate of retirements for folks who um, felt that now was the time to, to make their exit from the board. And the linchpin of all of that was Brittany's work and Brittany's work with the administrative unit. So nearly all of those new staff, those new faces that you see, the new faces that are getting those awards in the past couple of years, um, those in some way or another, Brittany helped them become members of the Central Valley Water Board. And for that, I absolutely thank you, Brittany, for all your work. Um, and this is absolutely an, an honor well-deserved. So, for all of the folks that you honored today, uh, Patrick, I'm sure I'm speaking for the board. Uh, we thank you very, very much. Uh, it shows also that even in tough times now, we're, or it'll certainly abnormal times when, uh, uh, because of COVID, uh, this board has still stays extremely productive. The the board uh, the board staff is is second to none, uh, top notch, and and we thank you very much. And I, I invite the board members to uh, join in with me. To oh, there's answer. one more award. Oh, one more award. Yeah, one Sorry, more I award. thought that was the last one. <laughs>
Uh, one more word is going out to Sean Walsh. I don't know if he's here. I think I see his name on the Zoom list. Sean's here. There we go. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Sean? It's going good. Thank All you. All right. Um, Sean works in the confined animals unit in uh, the Rancho Cordova office. Um, Sean's incredible dedication in so many areas to help the Central Valley Water Board maintain excellence uh, in the confined animals unit. Sean sets the bar for excellence and fills a key role for the unit as an indispensable resource. Sean consistently continues to provide outstanding technical and regulatory support as part of the enforcement team's productive efforts to bring several dairies into compliance with the Dairy General Order and individual waste discharge requirements. His attention to detail and vast knowledge of how each dairy operates were instrumental in the team's recent success in adopting several cease and desist orders. He is also diligent in following up on key deliverables and actions required by dischargers under CDOs to ensure compliance. In addition to his work on formal enforcement orders, Sean continues to inspect dairies and perform his other duties in a very busy unit. His team approach is greatly appreciated. Sean's mentoring and sharing of knowledge with other staff increases the unit's overall productivity. During facility inspections and investigations, Sean often engages with dairy owners and operators who are at times hesitant to communicate with regulators. However, he has developed a reputation for fairness and consistency. His professional approach is greatly appreciated. We are very fortunate to have Sean working in the Confined Animal Facilities Unit and he is well deserving of this award. Uh, congratulations, Sean. Thank you. John, I include you in the comments that I've already made. And uh, you guys just do a tremendous job. I invite the other board members uh, joining me a round of applause to, to congratulate you on what you've been doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I see Danny Gaiman, uh, 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 Sean's supervisor, raising his hand. I'll unmute him for a second. You can unmute, Danny. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, get in on the round of applause. And <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I've been here since March 2021, and it's been a joy and a privilege to work with Sean and the rest of the unit. And, and he really is a consummate professional, and I really rely on him, and, and I really am thankful for, for uh, this award for him. <clears throat> All right, and a quick note from Brett too, Brett Braidman. Yeah, hi, Patrick. Uh, I just want to echo uh, what you said about uh, Brittany Elliott. Brittany was on the call, but she had some problems uh, unmuting. So she heard everything you said. And, Fantastic. And Kelly and I were, you know, 100%. Um, she has been a tremendous asset to uh, Region 5 and all three offices, filling very big shoes, as you might remember, Steve Thompson, who did that for a number of years. So thank you for the accommodation. Awesome. And thank you so much. Dr. Longley, I'd just like to comment. I mean, it's such a, an honor to uh, have the uh, staff that are acknowledged and receive the awards. They do such a dynamic job. And those that don't receive the awards, I mean, we have a great group of people. So. I'm really pleased to see the recognition that they're getting today and congratulations to all of them and uh, congratulations to the retiree as well. So we're, we're delighted for the success and the accomplishments of our team. Thank you, Denise, that is so true. Any, uh, any further comments? I would just like to say I, I appreciate it as well. It's easy to get on a Zoom call, you know, uh, once every couple months review agendas and, and meet with staff, the real work uh, happens obviously with the staff. So again, just want to extend my personal uh, thank you and appreciation to all the hard work and effort and congratulations on, on the retirements. Any further comments? With that, uh, Patrick, is there, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to ask board members uh, if they have any comments on any items in the executive officer's report. which by the way shows that folks are still out there hustling real hard, protecting water quality. I wanna thank them for that. 
it, it is quite incredible. Most of the um, most of the targets are tracking very similar to where the targets were pre-pandemic, um, with a bit of a blip occurring last year, not this this fiscal year, but last fiscal year when when the shift happens. I think the board has adapted incredibly well uh, to the new environment. And just um, you know, kind of a quick word. I know. I discussed it with a couple of the board members beforehand. Uh, we are still planning on having an October board meeting in person in Reading. Of course, we are tracking all sorts of uh, governor's developments uh, with respect to executive orders, with respect to uh, public health orders, um, any changes to legislation that would enable hybrid meetings. Uh, all of that we're, we're gonna watch uh, very closely, very carefully, and certainly inform you, uh, members of the board, if there are any changes uh, to the directives uh, provided there. Um, I'd also kind of briefly note, just uh, uh, for your purposes, that uh, the way that, that this organization is structured, we're currently um, uh, beginning to implement uh, a new policy with respect to masks and vaccinations. And the whole concept is that um, as you've heard, um, state employees, just like the members of the, of the uh, board staff, uh, will demonstrate uh, confidentially uh, whether they have been vaccinated or not. Uh, and if not, or if they choose not to disclose, uh, then they will be subject to testing requirements, which are still being worked out by our HR and with the unions and things like that. Um, so that is currently where the status is. I know um, the management team has been constantly kind of in a state of uh, adapting to new cha challenges of, of new directives. Um, that's the current status. Uh, I certainly hope by October, I'll have more to fill you in on what the current status is. Hopefully, um, you know, any surge due to the Delta variant will be behind us by that point and we'll be certainly well uh, on our road to a sense of normalcy. But that's, that's kind of my update. Um, there's quite a lot in the executive, manage, uh, executive officer's report, as usual. Um, I have to give a lot of thanks to all the program managers and uh, Mindy, who's been instrumental in assembling this, and, and Janelle has pitched in a little bit too, but I think um, this is really uh, a team effort to put this document together for you. Um, and certainly I'll have a, a more comprehensive summary of the program, individual programs later on uh, this board meeting when I give the state of the region uh, address to you, which I do every August. Um, but certainly if you have any questions about issues in the EO report, I'm happy to answer them or at least um, find out the answer for you if I can't answer it off the top of my head. Any questions or comments by board members? Well, hearing none, thank you very much, Patrick. And with that, we'll move on to uh, agenda item six, approval of the minutes for the prior board meeting. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved, Chair. Uh, Member Abdus. <laughs> I have a correction. I have a correction. Uh, at the, la the very last page, item 23, I think we have two vice chairs on that page and it should, it should just be one. I just, uh, I think Vice Chair Ramirez was there twice. So I think it's at the top of the page. So that was the only correction that I saw. So uh, Nick, would you accept that, uh, that change? Of course. Very good. I'll, I'll second the motion with that correction. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Roke, is there any discussion? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Board Member Bradford? Yes. Board Member Brar? Yes. Vice Chair Kadara? Yes. Board Member Yang? Aye. Board Member Avdis? Yes. Uh, we do not, do we have um, Carmen? No. Okay, and Chair Longley? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion uh, carries. Uh, we move to agenda item uh, seven, the uncontested calendar. This is the time and place for a public hearing to consider uncontested items 12 through 15. In addition, item 11 is not being contested and will be considered as part of this item. So we're looking really at items 11 through 15. Mindy, has anyone submitted an email requesting to comment on any of the uncontested items? 
Um, we do have some uncontested uh, on the spreadsheet, but for the uncontested items, they've either indicated they will raise their hand or they were just listening. So we have nobody wishing to speak to this board on any of the uncontested items. I see no hands raised. Thank you, Jean. Um, very good. Are there any late revisions? No late no revisions. Late revisions Dr. Longley. I understand there are no late revisions. Very good. I'll go ahead and close the hearing. And uh, I open for a motion in a second. I'll move approval. Nick's moved. Uh, do I have a second? Thank I'll you. second. Mark seconds. Uh, call the roll, please. Board Member Bradford? Yes. Board Member Burr? Yes. Vice Chair Kadara? Yes. Board Member Yang? Aye. Board Member Avdis? Yes. And Chair Longley? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, before we go into the irrigated lands item, agenda item eight, I'm going to call a, it's about two after uh, 10. Let's be back in uh, ready to go at 10 after 10. And um, there'll be agenda item eight, the irrigated lands regulatory program resolution to exempt the Goose Lake uh, sub watershed. And we're taking a brief recess. Hey, Dana, are you here? Dana is here. I, I see her, but... Um... She may have stepped away. Oh, there she is. There you are. Hey, Dana, I was wondering if you wanted me to run that presentation or if you plan to. I can do it if that works. Sure. Yeah, if you Should have any I trouble... Um, you can have it loaded. Good idea. Do I? Does that mean share screen now? Uh, hold off on that till they come back. But if you have any okay. trouble, let me know and I can run it from here as well.
Hey, Gene, is it okay if Goose Lake does a quick sound check? Sure. Um, Herb, did you want to try that, Herb, if you can hear us? You may unmute. Yeah, yeah I can hear. Perfect. We can hear you just fine. Oh, great. Well, thank, thank you. you. There's a little bit of an echo, unless there are two of you talking at the same time. And there was a little bit there. <laughs> well, That's sounds, perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. Bruce is here. Did I hear Herb Jasper? Yeah, that's hard here. And Brian. Yeah. Very good. We got uh, Brian Ingram, the chair of the board as well. Excellent. Uh, hey, Gene, sound test. Sounds good. Thanks, Bob.
Okay, we're back in session. Very good. We're ready for agenda item eight, the irrigated land regulatory program resolution to exempt Goose Bay, excuse me, Goose Lake sub watershed. This time the board will consider a resolution amending the waste discharge requirements general order for growers within the Sacramento River watershed that are members of a third party group. This hearing will be conducted in accordance with the notice of public hearing and the meeting procedures published with the meeting agenda. This time evidence should be introduced on whether the proposed action should be taken. All persons expecting to testify, please raise your right hand and take the following oath. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give is the truth? If so, answer, I do. I do. Please state your name, address, affiliation, and whether you have taken the oath before testifying. Following the staff presentation, interested persons will be allowed three minutes each to address the board and a timer will be used. Does council have any legal issues to discuss at this time? Not at this time. Jessica, if I could, um, the disclosure that Carl was mentioning. Yes. Was that, was the disclosure made or do we have a? Sorry, yes, we do have a disclosure. There was an email. It was a, a minor communication um, that did not have any substantive effect. Very good. We'll now begin with the staff presentation. Looks good, Dana. Thanks, Jean. Okay, good morning, Chair Longley and members of the board. My name is Dana Kalesha, staff in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, and I have taken the oath. I'm here with Sue McConnell, Chief of the Irrigated Lands Program, and Susan Fergain, Senior Environmental Scientist in the Irrigated Lands Program. Today, we are bringing a resolution to the board to remove the requirement to participate in the Irrigated Lands Program for a small group of irrigated pasture and hay operations. The resolution would revise the Sacramento River Watershed General Order to exempt irrigated agriculture in the Goose Lake subwatershed. In this presentation, I'm going to provide some background information on this project, including a brief summary of the Irrigated Lands Program, tours, outreach, and a board information item that have occurred, UC Davis and UC Cooperative Extension Research Findings, the staff recommendations document, as well as the proposed order revision and comments received. The Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program was developed in 2003 to protect surface waters in the Central Valley from agricultural runoff. In 2012, regulations to protect groundwater were added. The program was developed as a broad regulatory tool to encompass all of commercial irrigated agriculture, even the most intensive valley floor operations. Information gathered through implementation of the program, through public input and research conducted, has shown that it might be time to focus on intensive operations that are causing water quality issues in certain areas. There are just over 6 million acres of irrigated agriculture in the Central Valley region. The black circle that you can see in the northeastern corner of the state shows the Goose Lake watershed. This area contains about 7,000 irrigated agricultural acres managed by 29 ranchers and growers. Over the past few years, we've met with several upper watershed groups to see firsthand their low impact farming practices and to hear growers' concerns. In 2017 through 2019, staff and board members toured the watersheds of Fall River, Pitt River, Upper Feather River, and Goose Lake. 
there were also outreach meetings and listening sessions conducted. In October 2019, staff presented information on potential alternative regulatory options for upper watershed and or pasture operations at the board meeting. Based on the work conducted through 2019, the project was focused in on the Goose Lake watershed as a starting point. In 2020, researchers at UC Davis, UC Cooperative Extension, conducted research and surveys in the Goose Lake watershed in coordination with the Irrigated Lands Program. I'll provide more information on the research next. Based on their findings, staff released a draft exemption recommendation in February of this year for initial public comment. Ken Tate, Tina Saitone, and their colleagues at UCD and UCCE have provided invaluable information for this project through the research and reports conducted in the Goose Lake watershed. So I wanna thank them for collaborating with us. The Goose Lake Watershed 2019 Farm Survey reported 7,060 irrigated acres managed by 29 ranchers and growers, with 91% of that in grass pasture and 9% in alfalfa hay. 14% of acres reported using nitrogen fertilizer, and none reported using field scale pesticides. This was confirmed by staff review of the DPR pesticide use reports and discussion with the Agricultural Commissioner. Although some ranches use nitrogen fertilizer, UCD research finds that there isn't sufficient nitrogen available to affect beneficial uses in this watershed. In the valley floor regions where agriculture is the predominant land use, several water quality issues have been identified through monitoring and they have emerged as the focus of efforts in this program. These include pesticides and toxicity in surface water and nitrate in groundwater. However, these impacts have not been measured in the Goose Lake subwatershed, where open rangeland is the predominant crop type and reported pesticide and fertilizer use occurs rarely or never. Surface water monitoring conducted from 2007 through 2020 in the Goose Lake subwatershed did not find any of the program's high priority water quality issues, which again are pesticides, toxicity, and groundwater nitrate. The UCCE 2020 Goose Lake economic analysis found that while the typical goose lake grower rarely, if ever, uses inputs tied to high priority water quality issues, and also while none of these issues have been identified in the goose lake watershed, the regulatory costs to a typical rancher here can be eight times higher proportional to a typical valley floor grower's costs when revenue figures are factored in. This equates to a de facto subsidization of intensive crop regions by low profit, low impact crops located hundreds of miles from the water quality issues. In February, 2021, staff released the draft staff exemption recommendation for a 30 day public comment period. 12 comment letters were received, including from industry organizations, coalition representatives and local ranchers. All 12 commenters voiced support for the proposed exemption, as well as the request to expand the exemption to additional upper watersheds. The proposed order revision would exempt Goose Lake Watershed irrigated agricultural operations from the requirement to obtain regulatory coverage in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. If actions are needed in the future to address any unforeseen water quality issues or new priorities, an appropriate regulatory mechanism will be identified and implemented. Staff released the draft resolution order for a 30-day public comment period. So in June, we had the second public comment period on the proposed exemption. 11 comment letters were received including industry organizations, coalition representatives, and local ranchers. Just like in the first public comment period, all 11 letters were in support of the proposed exemption as written with requests to expand the exemption to additional upper watersheds. In 
In summary, staff supports this exemption. Data shows that the existing ILRP regulatory framework is unnecessary in this watershed since high priority agricultural water quality issues are not occurring here. Pesticides and fertilizers that could impact beneficial uses are rarely, if ever used, and yet ranchers are paying a much higher cost proportionately. Finally, in addition to the listening sessions over the past few years, we held two public comment periods this year and only received support for this proposal. Staff recommends adoption of the resolution to exempt the Goose Lake watershed from current ILRP requirements. At this time, I'd like to submit the presentation, agenda package, and associated files into the record. This concludes the presentation, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to what extent are you monitoring groundwater and surface water in this basin, in this sub basin? or sub-watershed, I should say. Through the irrigated lands program, there were samples collected for several years for surface water, and there haven't been um, groundwater samples collected through the irrigated lands program. Okay, will there be any surface water sampling continuing in the future? Through the, um, through the irrigated lands program, if they were exempted from the program, um, there wouldn't be required monitoring. Through any other program? Um, I'm not sure about that. I'd like to have a canary in the mind, but uh, okay. Are there any further questions? I guess I had the I had the same question, Carl. But um, based on you know the history of monitoring up there, it doesn't seem like there is a problem. So unless their practices changed in the future, um, I don't know how we would know about that, other than having the uh, canary in the coal mine, as you mentioned. But yeah, I, I but I support I support them uh, the resolution here. I, I support the resolution, but um, how far below? the uh, sub-watershed is, is there monitoring? Um, Can I weigh in on this? Yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Susan Fregain. Um, so the Goose Lake Basin is a closed basin. It has not had any um, discharges from that basin to the Pitt River for 150 years. So mm -hmm. there aren't any monitoring locations that would represent discharges. Okay. Just we about to Susan. ask Susan to weigh in on that one. Yeah. <laughs> a very unique area. I've visited it in the past. Um, very good. Any further comments or questions by board members? Uh, Dr. Longley, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with the uh, staff recommendations. Uh, the fact that they have the least amount of uh, uh, impact and they're paying the, uh, the high, a high cost versus some of the other areas. I mean, to me, that was, that was, that was, would have been a, a question, a concern of mine, and I think it was addressed. So I, I'm in support of the staff recommendations. Any further comments? Thank you, Denise. Dr. Longley, I think, I guess after public comment, but I would just echo uh, Denise's comments as it related to costs of compliance uh, for such a um, uh, low or non-existent threat to water quality. And uh, I would just like to say that in terms of um, efforts going forward, I, I really appreciate the work that went into this. Um, can I ask how long it took uh, staff? Like, what did this process look like? And and Dr. Longley, if 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 you say wait till after public comment, I'm happy to do that. But I have some questions on the process here. Uh, okay, uh, Nick and staff can be preparing an answer. Uh, let's move to um, interested persons. Um, Dr. Longley, so Goose Lake is available to speak and in. in um, the Sac Valley Coalition has a presentation. Okay, uh, Herb Jasper then, is that who you said? Yes, 
I'm looking at the list here. He's next on the list. Very good. We'll take the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, first of all, to the board for allowing us to have a portion of the presentation here made. I'm a rancher from the Goose Lake uh, Basin, have been for many years. Uh, we have, uh, through the Goose Lake RCD, been very progressive in uh, monitoring water and, and making sure we're at. We go clear back into the 90s when we started with the Goose Lake Fishes Working Group. Uh, and started sampling and checking turbidities and temperatures, E. coli, and at that point, and we jumped through this clear into the formation of the coalition. Uh, the Goose Lake Basin Coalition was actually 2005, and then later on we were uh, joined into the Sac Valley Coalition for uh, administration. But what it is up there is irrigated pasture and hay. That's it. We don't have other agriculture products. And most all of your water is uh, across sodded uh, ground. And as was indicated there, uh, very little uh, fertilizer use or pesticide use. And we would encourage and have been encouraging this all along. And I want to thank the the staff members that have worked hard on this, also uh, UC Extension, and without going into the details of everybody, uh, NRCS, but we've got a lot of cooperation and help along the way. And uh, we don't intend to, to drop the ball here, but uh, it is a, a very uh, minute chance of anything changing up there in the way of the agriculture operations. Right now, we're going through a, a severe drought situation where Goose Lake is actually completely dry and was indicated before it does not run over. It, it hasn't been full for, uh, as it, they may indicate, 150 years to run over. Uh, so it, it's very minimal. And again, I want to thank the staff and the other entities that have helped us out most of all. But the Goose Lake RCD is still there would, would like to take more direction in projects that help the water quantity as well as water quality in that area. And uh, that's the primary entity there that took this on uh, for the coalition. And I want to thank you again for your time. And I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Jasper? Mr. Jasper, you mentioned that uh, Goose Lake is dry. When was the last time, if ever, was Goose Lake dry? Uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, it went dry. And it was on a 60-year cycle. 29 through 34 went dry, and then again in 92. And to be honest with you, I was hoping I'd never see it dry again. But no, I, I, I understand that just speaks to horrible climatic issues that we have right now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any uh, further questions for Mr. Jasper? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, who's next on the list, Mindy? Bruce Houchelt from um, Sacramento Valley Water Coalition. Bruce, go, go ahead. Good morning, Chair Longley, uh, members of the board, uh, Bruce Houchelt, Director of Water Quality, Northern California Water Association, the third party representing uh, the Sacramento Valley Water Quality Coalition. I have a presentation, but uh, I got to tell you, your staff, uh, uh, covered a lot of the points uh, that uh, that I was going to make. Uh, I want to start just like uh, like Herb did in thanking your board. Uh, Susan Fergain has the longest history with Goose Lake. She was the uh, board's liaison when Goose Lake was its own uh, coalition back in the day. Uh, Sue McConnell, Lynn Coster, Rebecca Tabor, um, Adam Lappitz, who probably holds the record for most visits to Goose Lake and probably have to retire uh, a regional board vehicle uh, as a result of that. 
And I, I really especially want to thank uh, staff for their for their attention on this issue, not only for Goose Lake, but the upper watersheds in a dynamic period of time in water quality policy, uh, both in the development of the waste discharge requirements that happened uh, around 2009 to 2014, uh, the, the issue of drinking water quality, which is dominant in the you know, in, in throughout the Central Valley. And then of course, uh, Chair Longley, um, you were uh, very, very involved in the development of the CV Salts Basin Plan. So I do wanna thank staff for their time uh, in focusing in on this. You know, during the last time also, there've been a lot of board members that have come and gone. Uh, you know, Bob Snyder uh, is on the board, John Costantino, uh, and then, you know, our, uh, uh, Jenny Lester Moffat, who uh, just a couple of days ago was um, confirmed as the new uh, undersecretary at USDA. So I wanted to briefly describe, uh, you know, for those newer members of the board, the upper watersheds, and uh, uh, I'll do this very quickly because a lot of points have been covered by your staff. And I just want to underscore uh, that, you know, here as we enter the third decade of the Irrigated Lands Program, um, the data is coming together uh, that provides uh, the confidence in which you can begin to uh, make the decisions that are before you. So as Dana covered, there's been a, in the last decade, a lot of tours and visits. And um, so I just, there's a highlight of those, but I think she did it well. Uh, Dana's, uh, Dana's uh, PowerPoint was a lot better with a circle than my little uh, arrow there, but here's an interesting fact. Goose Lake's actually closer to Eugene, Oregon than it is to Rancho Cordova by just about 20 miles. But it just goes to tell you the distance between, between this part uh, of the world and uh, others. Here we are. Uh, you can see uh, Lynn Coster, Su Susan Fregain. You can see Herb in this picture. You can see Ken Tate and Tina Satone and others when we visited Goose Lake in 2019. As was mentioned earlier, this is a high desert area. It's a closed basin that's uh, at about 4,800 feet in elevation. Just another picture of the Goose Lake area. The Warners are on the left there. And um, as Dana mentioned in her presentation, uh, very limited, uh, no, no pesticide use. It was approved for reduced monitoring management practice and groundwater quality trend monitoring shows no nitrates. Uh, I'll circle back. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned um, that I have taken the oath uh, early on. So uh, let me just fit that in there. Uh, I think Dana had a different angle on this, uh, this picture, um, but this is uh, again, the Goose Lake area. So, and you know, we support it because of the water quality results, because of the documentation of management practices, the investment of, um, that benefits water quality. It is consistent with the strategic plan that you're working your way through of aligning the requirements based on threat to water quality and certainly the climate, the hydrology and the seasonal nature of agriculture, not only in the Goose Lake, but the upper watersheds uh, makes it unique. And this is a dramatic picture that shows that. Um, while there's 8 million acres in the upper watersheds, only about 5% of that is irrigated agriculture and it's interspersed with national forests, national forests, timber, refuges, um, only about 240,000 acres of our 1.3 million are in the upper watersheds. Uh, this shows uh, some of the work that your staff has been uh, doing over the past decade. These are reduced monitoring areas in the coalition area. So um, we appreciate that. Uh, I should say, Bruce, that every board member should visit that area many times. That's some of the most spectacular scenery in the world. Oh yeah, and I appreciate the first time I ever met you, Carl, I think was at NEC was, uh, annual meeting on a snowy day in February, which is a very different climate than Fresno is in February, right? That was in 2009 and it is beautiful. And this picture is a little blurry, but it does show uh, when we were visiting and you can see Patrick there and Rebecca Tabor and, and uh, the ranchers in that area. Uh, you know, just, just a, some more pictures. Uh, the Upper Feather River, which I, I think I understand is uh, in the process of doing the same thing that, um, that was done in Goose Lake, you know, as a high alpine area, it's seasonal agriculture. And as uh, Dana mentioned and Dr. Cetone documented, it's comparatively low economic margins for those livestock operations. 
Um, you know, they get about 70 inches of rain on the western slope in, you know, most years, right? Not this year. And as you can see from, uh, from this illustration, uh, the Sacramento Valley, um, you see the three basins of the uh, Central Valley, but the Sacramento Valley does uh, receive a lot of, uh, a lot of precipitation. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is the uh, uh, Pitt, Pitt River area or Nequa area, and you can see, you know, low uh, incidence of, in monitoring of, uh, of exceedances for pesticide, nutrients, salinity, et cetera. Um, it's uh, the upper watersheds like the Sacramento Valley are unique natural and working landscape. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're the habitat for 50% of the threatened and endangered species. You know, the winter run, spring run salmon, steelhead and other fish species. And we have six national wildlife refuges among and more than 50 state refuges. So Sacramento Valley is a little different and uh, that's a picture of one of them. And there's a significant investment in education and outreach as Herb and Brian mentioned in, in their presentation. Um, they're in, and this is one of my favorite pictures. There's Carol uh, Dobas and uh, folks in the Upper Feather River who, uh, you know, uh, brand, uh, brand their participation in protecting water quality through this. Um, and this is a picture of one of the BMPs repairing friendly grazing. So in conclusion, we appreciate regional board's commitment to, uh, to this process, um, given the, the uh, uh, you know, the other priorities in the last decade. Um, we appreciate them uh, doing the reduced monitoring. You know, the groundwater quality results show no impact for, on drinking water. And let me just expand upon that. We have a groundwater quality trend monitoring network that includes not Goose Lake, but uh, the Pitt River system includes the Upper Feather River system. And we've been doing that. We'll be heading out for our fourth round of groundwater quality trend monitoring um, that's, that's going on right now. So we support staff's recommendation and, um, and would, um, you know, hope that, uh, that in the next, uh, you know, six months to a year that, um, that other areas that, uh, uh, demonstrate uh, what uh, Goose Lake has demonstrated uh, will also be considered for exemption uh, from the Irrigated Lands Program. And uh, with that, I will uh, I will take any questions anyone has. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, questions? I guess you did a a very thorough job. <laughs> well, I want to appreciate. I know that was more than three minutes. It was probably more than five minutes. So, you know, but I, I thought it was important because uh, both you and uh, Vice Chairman Kadera um, were the only board members that I can remember, you know, in that fall 2017 that are still on the board. So I think it's important mm -hmm. for those who haven't visited the area to get a little snapshot. And you're right, it is a beautiful area. So it's a, it's a, it, Little known and not sufficiently appreciated part of California. The backside of Shasta is one of the most beautiful. The Modoc Plain is a beautiful area. Uh, over there, you see Shasta. You see two big mountains, and it's unbelievable. Um, thank you very much for for your presentation. Uh, moving on to um, interested persons. Um, who is next on our list? Uh, Ken Tate and Tina Satone with UC Cooperative Extension. Very good. You may unmute. Uh, we've unmuted Ken, Kenneth and... Okay, this is Ken. Can you hear me? We can hear you well. Okay, great. I, I'm not able to turn my video on, but I think that's fine. Um, Dr. Saito and I just wanted to be available um, after staff presentation to take any questions that you might have about um, either the water quality research or the economic evaluation um, that was done. Um, just want to assure you that there's, there's solid data and evidence behind, I think, these reviews that there are low risk conditions there. Um, quite a for as small an area as Goose Lake is, there's a lot of a lot of data and a lot of research being conducted there. And um, 
So if you have any questions about that, we're happy to take them. I'd also like to let you know that it's um, Bruce and staff alluded to the fact that we're moving on to looking at other upper watershed areas and collecting very similar data. In fact, the exact same data that we collected at Goose Lake in terms of agronomic practices, um, as well as, um, um, excuse me, there we go, agronomic practices, as well as um, BMPs implemented, as well as productivity, uh, profitability data. So that for the upper uh, watersheds, uh, including the upper Feather River, the pit and others, staff will have at hand and you will have at hand that kind of information to make an informed decision, whatever your decision might be. Um, we wanna make sure that we're working with folks to provide that data. And it's really important to, for me to point out that you know, our, our names come up a lot as, as being the lead for that aspect of it. But uh, Brian and with NRCS and, and Goose Lake interviewed all 29 of those ranchers and collected that information. All 29 of those ranchers took time to come into the office and provide that information. Um, Tracy Shore with Cooperative Extension in the Upper Feather River has interviewed uh, over 80 ranchers in that area. And we have almost complete um, responses from the ranchers in the Upper Feather River and we're moving on to the pit. And I think Pam, Jack and I will speak a little bit later. We'll talk about our, our future efforts. And so we'll, we're working on processing and analyzing that data collaboratively with staff um, so that as we move forward to discuss other watersheds, we'll, we'll have the information to address your questions. Yeah, Tina, unless you have something. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, and um, we appreciate the, the efforts in, that you and your colleagues are undertaking to working on, on, on these watersheds, presenting the information to this board for its decision-making process. Uh, your, your information has been invaluable. Are, are there any questions for Mr. Tate? Once again, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Pam. Pam, excuse me, I've met you, but I don't, your last name, Giacomi, am I right? It's Giacomini, Dr. Lolly. Giacomini, I should know Yeah, that. it's okay, not bad. You've only collect, uh, corrected <laughs> me three or four times. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. You've been on my ranch, it's okay. <laughs> I have so, been there. Yes, sure. you have. Yes, it was awesome. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so Dr. Longley, uh, Vice Chair Kadara, and board members and staff, thank you so much for letting me uh, comment. Um, I am Pam Giacomini. I'm a rancher in Hat Creek, which is in the Upper Pit watershed. Um, we've been fortunate to meet with you for many years now, and so that gets to uh, board member Advis's question on how long we've been having this discussion, correct? Um, so it's been wonderful to be able to host you up here, and I hope that um, in the future, sometime soon, those board members that I have not been able to meet in person um, will be able to, we can do a tour. Uh, so it sounded positive for October, maybe being an in-person meeting and perhaps we can set something up then that would be fabulous. But um, as you saw in Bruce's presentation, we've had over 10 years of monitoring data in Northeastern California Water Association that shows little to no risk for adverse effects to water quality. And you heard from Dr. Tate and you know from uh, Dr. Saitome's work and others, uh, the science, the best management practices and economics coupled together make a very strong case to exempt Goose Lake area from the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. This action would align with one of your strategic goals, which is to match the regulatory burden with the risk posed. And I think that's really a very excellent strategic goal on your part. So there's a group of us that have been working together, being Dr. Tate, Dr. Saitone, myself, and many other UC cooperative extension agents um, that really believe that this can be replicated in other areas. High upper elevation con continuous forage operations are far different than valley floor intensive agriculture. And that's where that comes to that balance of you know, what do we look at from the risk as opposed to the regulatory burden and the cost that landowners share? So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I thank you for your consideration in uh, your action today. 
Thank you very much for your comments. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to uh, Carrie Fisher. California Farm Bureau. You can unmute Carrie. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. I'm Carrie Fisher with the California Farm Bureau, and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. Farm Bureau supports this exemption um, because of the low threat of irrigated pasture as seen by the management practices, irrigation practices and methods and agronomic practices in this area. We really appreciate the work of UC um, Davis and UC Cooperative Extension and the board's reception of those findings. And we look forward to continued work uh, by UC Davis and UC Cooperative Extension in the upper um, watersheds. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to Paul Roan, Sierra County. Don't see him. Yeah, we don't see Paul in the list. Okay. Uh, Victoria Rodriguez said that she would be speaking and she'll raise her hand when she wanted to speak. Uh, I think Victoria, <laughs> Now, now is your time. I'm here. Hi. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Longley, Vice Chair Kadara, and the board members. Um, I, my name is Victoria Rodriguez, and I am the regulatory advocate for the California Cattlemen's Foundation. And I would just like to express my support for the staff recommendations for all the reasons that have been stated, the many reasons that have been stated. I would just emphasize that the irrigated pastures do provide critical forage for livestock and with the amount of grazing done on those lands and the high costs associated with regulatory, um, re the regulatory um, compliance for that area um, makes it really difficult with low, low yield for um, ranchers and producers in that area to be able to continue this work. So I would really appreciate the work that's been done and um, the data that emphasizes the best management practices that are taken. And again, would just like to support the staff recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Earlier, Dr. Tate uh, held out that he would answer questions after the interested persons had talked if someone has come up with a question. Does anybody have a question for Dr. Tate or Dr. Saitone? Uh, Dr. Tate, I do have one question. Just for perspective, uh, what is the average uh, number of acres for each cow-calf unit on uh, the irrigated pasture in, in this area? Yeah, a good, a good rule of thumb is about two acres for a cow and her calf on irrigated pasture. Um, Pretty much throughout the the northern northeastern part of the state, mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty, and that'll be for about a six month grazing period during the summer growing season. Okay, and um, I take it that you've not seen significant runoff of uh, nitrate or manure from 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 these areas. Is that correct? And that's correct, and you know if you if you think about and. Tina can speak to the to the nitrogen fertilizer application. It's, it just it pe doesn't pencil out economically to fertilize certainly pasture that you're going to manage with grazing. Um, it would potentially can it can pencil out with hay production where you harvest it as hay and there's no grazing during that irrigation season. Um, every place that we've seen nitrogen used, which has been very few places, has been in a hay hay situation on an actively grazed pasture. Um, the cost of nitrogen and the uh, limited rate of return in terms of productivity just make it make it fairly unfeasible. Um, and what kind of soils typically do you find on these pastures? Often, you know, they're they're often they have um, some have organic soils, almost wetland, so they're pretty well developed soils on the top. Often they're a bit shallow. Um, sometimes over a clay pan. So you might have a, a foot to a foot and a half of fairly decent soil with a high uh, organic matter due to the perennial kind of riparian or gracious plants that make up the plant community. Um, mm -hmm. The limiting factor, and I know the concerns about continued monitoring and potential increases in agricultural intensity, intensity there. Um, 
really, given the elevation of most of these places, 5,000 feet and above, um, growing degree days is a limiting factor in terms of going to a different crop. Um, the vast majority of the species that are grown there work well there. Um, Very good. Uh, any further questions for Dr. Tate? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, with that, I'll go to uh, closing remarks from staff. Dr. Longley, I, I think, you know, to kind of answer some of the questions um, with respect to the length of time, I think a lot of these efforts um, have been underway for a while. Uh, the board around 2018 and 2019, some of the meetings up in uh, Reading really gave permission to move ahead in this direction. Um, so the request was, look, we, we are probably extending ourselves. It's unusual for um, a regulatory agency to step back from regulating. Uh, but I think, you know, as, as Susan and uh, Dana and Sue described, uh, we've got the information here to show that there are not significant water quality impacts due to the irrigation uh, of crops in this area, which is the trigger for whether you're in the irrigated lands program or, or not. Um, and so I think that since this is supported by the data, uh, we can you know, reasonably say we can take a step back from this uh, and uh, release them from the irrigated lands regulatory program and, and move forward and continue to regulate other activities that are actually impacting groundwater, that are actually impacting surface waters and use our limited resources in that manner. Um, and I do uh, want to throw uh, an extra thanks to uh, Dana for stepping in. Um, this was not necessarily her project from the start, uh, but she came up to speed very, very quickly um, and uh, it really helped understand all the information that we have at our disposal to make this decision here today. Um, so with that, I recommend uh, adoption of this resolution in order, uh, moving this forward and exempting these 29 growers from the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions uh, from board members for staff? Hearing none, I'll close the hearing and uh, we'll confine the discussion to deliberation and voting. Um, any comments? Dr. Lowney, I'll chime, I'll chime in here. I, I do appreciate that wrap up, uh, Patrick, um, and do commend the staff efforts here, understanding uh, your point and it's well taken that uh, uh, being a regulator, uh, certainly stepping back from regulation is no easy task. And um, there's obviously a lot of hard work uh, that has gone into this uh, from staff, definitely, certainly from stakeholders, and uh, do appreciate you know all the the analysis and and and, um, and data collection that went into that. So appreciate that, and I can't wait to visit this area. And some of those snapshots, and I kind of went on Google Earth uh, before the meeting to check it out. It does seem like a, a spectacular place up there. <clears throat> I'll say, uh, you know, coming from a ranching family and uh, somebody who dabbles in the cattle business, I, you know. Uh, know all too well the re realities faced by farmers and ranchers and the you know market forces the weather you know, government regulation you know they all they all impact the ability to continue a, certainly a very prized way of life in my opinion uh so my heart goes out to uh, these ranchers uh, across the state uh, during this challenging time i know um it's um it's definitely thrown thrown a lot of us for a curveball and uh, i'm you know, very sensitive to that so in terms of the action before us today, um, certainly it's in line with our strategic planning goals. And I think the takeaway that I would encourage is that uh, we continue to look at additional areas where, uh, you know, regulation can be streamlined to prioritize threats, um, certainly to water quality. Uh, and, that, you know, obviously the cost of compliance there too. I think uh, somebody, one of the commenters mentioned, and I, I agree wholeheartedly that uh, certainly regulation needs to be proportionate to the threat, um, to the the degree possible and feasible. So if there are other areas that can benefit from this sort of commensurate threat approach. I very much appreciate that. So I'll be very much supporting uh, the action today and I'll be happy to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation, obviously pending further, further board discussion. But. So I have a, a motion from Nick. Uh, I entertain further discussion and I'm looking for a second. 
I just add, um, I think the first time I heard about this issue is at the 2019 board meeting up in Reading. And I think some of the speakers that we've heard from today were at that meeting and uh, presented a pretty passionate case. Um, so I'm glad to see it come to fruition today. And I guess my only comment beyond this uh, agenda item is what sort of precedent this might be setting for other operations. I know we heard from a, an organic Christmas tree farmer. Um, we've had discussions with other organic farmers who also feel that they should be exempt. And I'm wondering what the process might be moving forward with looking at some of those other cases, if, if that's appropriate. No, I, I totally agree with you. I think um, uh, my kind of wholesale endorsement of, of this particular approach um, is relatively easy because the bar is really, really high uh, if this is the precedent. Um, I, I think it's, it's almost unique in terms of, of where this particular watershed is as, as kind of um, uh, Carl's question and, and Susan's answer uh, um, kind of show there's, there's not the connection that this has to the other kind of hydro hydrologic systems that we have throughout the state that we're concerned about with respect to CB salts and, and other things. So the, the bar is extraordinarily high here with it, if that, um, but with that said, I think we are looking at, at kind of uh, uh, scaling back where appropriate other types of regulatory efforts. Um, I think the uh, irrigated lands program in general um, Rebecca Tabor, who's uh, uh, out right now, but uh, she kind of has been instrumental in working through a number of monitoring reductions uh, for Sacramento Valley growers um, in particular, uh, when the existing data show that there are not water quality impacts due to their operations. Those are the types of efforts that we're engaged in. Um, and so I think we're always gonna look for opportunities. Um, you know, again, Precedent setting, I think with this one, the the watershed is so unique. It's it's very it's relatively small, and you're and you know as, as kind of uh, uh, Dr. Tate said, uh, we had an opportunity to talk with each one of the 29 growers up in this area and understand exactly what the conditions were, um, whether we'd be able to do that on a larger scale, talking with thousands and understanding that, uh, particularly when there are enrollees that are or, or folks who are not enrolled in the program, it gets a little more more complicated in other areas but but certainly that's that's kind of the you know the the um, the signal that this is sending that the, the regional board will recognize uh, when its regulations don't make sense, uh, I, I think is, is huge. Um, and, and I think that's something that we're gonna take forward uh, and, and continue to think about and think critically about as we uh, work on kind of all of our regulatory areas. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Uh, Mark, did, did you conclude your uh, comments with a second I didn't hear. Yeah, I did. And uh, thank you. And if there are no more other comments, I would second the motion. Are there any further comments? Yeah, I'd just like to come in, Dr. Longley. I, I did enjoy the visit there in 2017. I enjoyed looking at the nature and the beauty of the whole area and experiencing the air quality. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, you know, there were no negative impacts, I mean, no negative comments on this project and the fact that there has not been any uh, nitrates and pesticides uh, identified. Uh, it's, it's, it's a project that you want to be able to exempt from this project, uh, from the irrigated lands program. And uh, the comment earlier about, you know, it could be examples to use in the valley floor, uh, whatever, uh, um, uh, examples or management practices can, that can be used to benefit the valley floor certainly would be helpful, although we're talking about an upper watershed. But uh, I, I think as um, we look forward to the opportunity as board members when we see uh, no impacts to water quality. And this is indeed an example of that. So I thank Susan, Sue, and Dana, and all the staff that worked on it and uh, looking forward to the opportunity to extend my support to this project. Thank you Thank very much. Any further comments? If not, I will um, request the roll call be, the, the roll be called. 
Board Member Bradford? Yes. Board Member Brewer? Yes. Vice Chair Kadara? Yes. Board Member Yang? Yes. Board Member Avdis? Yes. And Chair Longley? Yes, and the motion is unanimously adopted. And uh, we're looking forward to moving. We're looking forward to moving forward on looking at the other uh, similar areas in in the um, in the, that high mountain area. Very good. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number nine. Irrigated Lands Program Status Update of the Drinking Water Well Monitoring. This is an information item only and no action will be taken, although the board may ask questions and provide direction to staff. Following the staff presentation, interested persons will be allowed three minutes each to address the board. Ready for the staff presentation? Bob, let me know if you need anything. Thank you. You see my screen? Uh, not yet, Bob. Okay. There's that final share. That there final we go. button. Yeah, we see it. There you go. All right. Good morning, Chair Longley and members of the board. I'm Bob Ditto, the Compliance and Outreach Unit Supervisor in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. I'm here today to give you an update on the drinking water well monitoring requirements for members or owners of commercial irrigated lands. I will start with a brief overview of the drinking water well monitoring program, provide some statistics on how the program is going, explain monitoring requirements, talk about our outreach efforts, and discuss our data management and notification process. In 2018, the State Water Board issued an order in response to petitions of the East San Joaquin waste discharge requirements. The State, Bar State Water Board's petition order required members of the ILRP to sample active drinking water wells located on enrolled parcels for nitrate plus nitrite as nitrogen. The purpose of the drinking water well monitoring is to first identify drinking water wells that have nitrate concentrations exceeding the drinking water standard, and second, to notify those well users of the potential health risks. This is a schedule we developed for the drinking water well monitoring program. The schedule was based on potential risks of groundwater exceedances in the area. We started in 2019 with the East San Joaquin Coalition shown in purple on the map and expanded into the Tulare Lake Basin in 2020, which includes seven water quality coalitions represented by the blue area. This year, our outreach includes the San Joaquin Delta, West Side San Joaquin, and the grassland drainage area. Next year, we will expand our outreach to the remaining coalitions for clarification, the red on the map is the Rice Commission area. Here's a breakdown of the drinking water well monitoring program, which includes the currently participating coalitions. The red text next to the coalition name represents each coalition phase in the program. There are approximately 15,000 members in the participating coalitions and 26% of the members have sampled. It is important to remember that not all members are required to sample, only those that have active wells on their enrolled parcels. Also, members of the San Joaquin Delta, Westside San Joaquin, and Grassland Drainage Area have until the end of this year to sample their wells. I'd also like to mention 
that we will receive data from this year's form evaluation to validate which members have active drinking water wells to help us determine members' compliance with the program. As of July 1st, we have over 7,300 wells that have been sampled with just under 30% exceeding the drinking water standard. I'll now briefly explain some of the drinking water well monitoring requirements. Members are initially required to sample their active drinking water wells annually. Samples need to be analyzed for nitrate plus nitrite as nitrogen. Sample testing must be performed by an ELAP laboratory certified for testing nitrate plus nitrite as nitrogen. And past data may be used, but needs to follow the program requirements. There is an exemption from sampling if the drinking water well is not used for human consumption, meaning it is not used for cooking or drinking. The members must keep records such as photo documentation or bottled water receipts, establishing that the well is not used for drinking water. This is the drinking water well member information form that members will use for the first year of sampling. Members are required to submit this form with their sample to the lab. We designed this form to make it easier for the laboratories to create accounts in GeoTracker, the state's groundwater database. The form asks for member information, a question to determine if the member or family is the only consumer, landowner information, and drinking water well information. The laboratory enters this data into GeoTracker and provides the member with a global ID number for the well. The global ID number is used for future sampling events. Based on sample results, a member will either continue to sample annually, or if the sample result exceeds the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter, the member will be required to follow the notification requirements, but no further sampling is required. After three years of consecutive samples, members will evaluate their results. If all results are less than eight milligrams per liter, sampling will be reduced to once every five years moving forward. If any sample result is between eight and 10 milligrams per liter, the member will continue to sample annually until they meet three consecutive years with all samples under eight milligrams per liter to reduce their monitoring requirements or if any one sample exceeds 10 milligrams per liter, they would follow the notification requirements and no further sampling is required. This is the notification template used to notify the users of the sample results and potential health risks associated with drinking the water. As I mentioned in a previous slide, Members will use this template when results exceed the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. They are required to immediately notify the users using the notification template and send a signed copy to the Central Valley Water Board. In the case where the member or the member's immediate family are the only users, they can use this template or fulfill this notification requirement by indicating this on the drinking water well member information form. This template contains information to help water board staff identify the member and parcel number. It also has questions regarding if anyone drinks the water, that the notification has been given to the users, and if replacement water was provided. It, had, it has also been translated into multiple languages. I'll now discuss some of our outreach efforts to help members understand the requirements for monitoring their drinking water wells. We created an outreach package to send to all members at the start of the year when they are required to sample. This includes a quick reference guide for members, a member information form, the notification template, and an informational trifold. We also send a reminder to sample postcard to coalition members each year and have provided outreach at coalition member meetings. Okay. 
We have updated our website with a new drinking water well monitoring webpage, information on drinking water sample requirements, ELAP laboratories, available forms, and frequently asked questions can be found here. Most of our outreach materials have been translated into Spanish, Punjabi, and Hmong. I will now discuss our data management and drinking water exceedance notification process. As I mentioned earlier, the drinking water well monitoring program requires the certified laboratories to enter the member well data from the drinking water well member information form into GeoTracker. The well information includes a county APN or latitude and longitude for the location of the well. GeoTracker is able to display this information in a public map. When you click on a well location, the test results and sample date are displayed. As directed by the state board petition order, none of the member's personal information is shown. One of our top priorities is to ensure notification is completed. Once an exceedance is submitted to GeoTracker and identified by staff, and we have not received a notification from the member, staff will send those members a notification request. This is usually in the form of a letter, but an email or phone call may be used initially. If the member does not respond to the notification request, a notice of violation is sent. We are currently at a 95% compliance rate and continue to follow up with members to ensure all notifications have been completed. As I mentioned in the previous slide, one of our top priorities is to ensure users are notified of potential health risks from drinking water that has exceeded the drinking water standard. Staff is actively tracking member notifications and other important information that you can see listed on the slide. As we evaluate the data, information regarding alternative or replacement water will be shared with the appropriate management zones. That concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very informative. Any questions? Any questions? Um, Bob, what is the, uh, as I understand from what you're saying, you're getting a 95% uh, return on the letters that go out. Was that the correct interpretation? Um, in terms of, yeah, us contacting the members who have exceeded, um, we're, we're, and this is an ongoing process. So at the current time, um, we're at 95%, but we are working hard to get that additional 5%. Very good. And you show the GeoTracker screen. Is there a way to modify that so that uh, the screen shows those samples that are over 10? Um, yes. Uh, I, basically, this we, we kind of created this program, so that, that's a great idea um, and something I have brought up to GeoTracker. Um, and it is one of the tickets, I think, that's um, up and coming. So we are working on modifying this, um, especially for this data tracking. So yes, that's definitely something we're working on. Very good. Are there questions from other board members? Yeah, I have a question, Robert. So Robert, what would you identify as uh, any of the challenges in getting that last 5%? I mean, what, what are your, what's your sense there? Um, uh, most of it is, uh, Confusion, um, I, you know, once we get a hold of somebody, we have really no problem getting the notification template. It's just reaching out. Um, so really it's just a process. Sometimes it takes a little longer based on um, trying to get a hold of people. But really, we, if we have the information, so on the member information form, there is an email um, and sometimes a phone number. So if those are valid, that, that's really our, our first kind of contact or outreach. And then if we don't get response there, uh, we will send that letter. Um, and I guess I'll mention this as well. Um, we work with GeoTracker to send an email. So when, when the sample is submitted into GeoTracker, 
And then based on that result, so if that result is uh, above 10, um, that email will send the notification template to that member with a brief description on what to do next. Um, if it's below, an email goes out saying, hey, continue to sample annually. So there's, you know, we're trying to, you know, get as much information out to the grower as quickly as possible. Um, but then our follow-up is, you know, more informal email, um, phone call, and then we'll go to the letter. If no response to the letter, we will send out a notice of violation. And we really haven't, in the scheme of things, sent out many notice of violations. It's been, you know, the compliance has been really high. So I've been pleased with that. That was going to be my follow-up question. So uh, that's good to hear that last part there. So thank you. No problem. Uh, Bob, I have a question. I, you noted that there were almost 30% of the wells that were sampled that were in exceedance. Uh, did that number surprise you or is that what was expected? And I'm also wondering how many people uh, were on those drinking water wells that were affected by this result? Good questions. Um, I, I'm not sure if the number surprised us in terms of, you know, the, the program started in the areas that were most impacted. Right. Um, so, and what I've been looking at in, in terms of the East San Joaquin to the Larry Lake Basin, so Larry Lake Basin does have some higher numbers um, above 30, but in terms of, and that was really expected as well in terms of the groundwater quality down there. Um, your second question on who is impacted, could you? Yeah, do you, know, do you know how many people are being served by those impacted wells? Um, I don't. Um, typically, that notification comes in um, that, you know, whoever's on that APN has been notified. So they report per APN and per well. Um, so that's something I might be able to answer later in the program, but right now I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, that, would, that was gonna be one of my questions. Uh, you know, the population is in, in pop the, the, the wells that are exceeding uh, the standard, are they in populated areas and what's that number? So uh, I heard uh, Robert say he would try to get information on that, but overall, I thought it was a good presentation. I like the 95% and would like to see that 5% come into compliance as well. Thank yes, you. definitely. And, and again, as we get more, we're in our third year of the program, we still don't have all the coalitions in. So um, as we get more data, data, we'll be able to tell a better story. Okay. Thank you. Any board member have a question? Bob, could, uh, could I do, I have another one. Uh, on the wells themselves, uh, what kind of data, if any, do you have on the wells insofar as where they're completed? Uh, um, yeah, we don't have any information on the actual well. So um, our outreach is targeted at the members to identify their wells and to sample them and then to notify the users that they exceed. So um, we don't have any detailed information on the well itself. Yeah, if we do just the type of pump they had on there, it'd give us some idea of, you know, centrifugal is, can't draw more than about 30 feet at the most uh, from uh, below the pump. Um, I suspect that most of these are uh, domestic wells. Is that correct? Yes, all of them are domestic wells. So they're all drinking water wells. We are not testing any ag wells in no. this part of the program. Good. Uh, Last question. Other... Along, yeah. along. Now, you were uh, saying that uh, they notify the users of the exceedances. Is, is, is that going well as far as notifying uh, as far as compliance and notifying people when their wells exceed the, um, the numbers? Uh, yes. And so in, in terms of that 95%, really, that's, that's what we're getting in terms of the member submitting the form that they have notified the users of the potential health risks. And so the notification template is that form that is used to give to that user to put on the well um, so yes, I, I think that's going very well. Now we don't have a individual to individual um, story to tell, but based on the numbers coming in, um, we think it's pretty successful and, and it's occurring. So. Okay. Thank you. Right, you say you're, you're not doing any egg wells. 
certainly that's true. But you know, what I'm wondering is where you have clusters, uh, maybe feeding three, four, or five, actually smaller than state smalls, um, you conceivably could be using a deeper well. And I don't know how and when, if it's even possible to get, get that well information, but it sure would be very useful for future work. Definitely. Okay, any further questions or comments? No, I, I would just note that um, in particular, one of the interesting dynamics of this program, uh, Dr. Longley, is that this, remember, is an outgrowth, not of a regional board initiative, but this was something that was bolted on uh, by the state board to our order as part of the East San Joaquin. Exactly. So while there was some deliberation about other types of well characteristics, um, you know, you see if you can find the you know, uh, DWR log or see if you can document when, what right. the screened interval is, um, you know, that that did not make it into the final cut of what the state board uh, put into the order. Um, but those conversations were there um, for the exact reasons that you were talking about. But I think for, for whatever reasons, um, what came out of it was really just a focus on let's get the nitrate information and let's get the, the nitrate information as quickly as possible. Um, the other kind of component to it, and, and I think this it goes a little bit to um, uh, Vice Chair Kadara's uh, uh, question, is, is that one of the, you know, kind of, I won't say oddity of the program, but I, I think something to keep in mind is that the sampling is just occurring on agricultural parcels. Uh, there are often communities that are right next door that are not getting sampled um, just because, you know, this, this requirement is part of our waste discharge requirements. It's not a comprehensive sampling scheme that the board kind of embarked upon. Some of that is being swept up in the CV salts monitoring efforts. I think that's kind of our, our backstop there to, to get additional nitrate information. But when you talk about why, you know, one site was sampled versus another, it is because this is, this is kind of a piecemeal program in that this is just doing the sampling on agricultural parcels. So um, I think that's part of the answer. I think the bigger, you know, kind of uh, uh, question is, is how do we kind of merge all this data together uh, and use it to, to kind of expand upon what the concerns are for the communities and individuals drinking these impacted wells. I think that kind of conversation is ongoing at the CV salts level, just for what it's worth. Okay. And yeah, and I guess uh, along with that, for those that uh, notified uh, the users of the high um, concentration of nitrates, what are, what are the corrective measures? I guess that's where you're talking about the CV salts. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that CV salts is actually what comes in and provides the corrective measures. Uh, again, that that's kind of one of the one of the interesting components of this, right? It, it's just a monitoring requirement. I think one of the things that we even uh, made some comments, I think uh, uh, Vice Chair Kadara, when they were considering the East San Joaquin order, I think you raised it too. It's like, look, you can't just have a monitoring requirement and then not expect a follow-up, you know, what, what do you do next? Um, and I think the answer really was CV salts is kind of the, the component that that's the mechanism by which replacement water is provided when we get that information. Um, but again, that's being rolled out in phases as well. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of credit to, to Bob and his team for getting this program up and running. This is a huge resource commitment to get this program running. It was not something that we kind of, incorporated into our long-term irrigated lands regulatory program kind of budget or structure because again this wasn't something that we planned for it wasn't something that was analyzed as part of our environmental documentation or, or regulatory process when we established the orders but i think uh, bob has been able to find the resources a 95 percent uh, uh, rate is actually incredibly outstanding for this type of work. Um, certainly the consequences are big, but not, 95 is really good. Um, I think there were some people who were saying, hey, you're going to be lucky to get double digits, you know, after, uh, when, when this thing is, is imposed. So uh, I think we're in good shape. Certainly we want to get that, that last 5% addressed as well. 
Um, but this is this is a big one, and and uh, a lot of credit to to Bob and his team to getting this stood up, um, and to Sue to making sure that the resources resource allocation and the program in general uh, went to those areas to get this thing uh, up and running and, and make it as successful as it has been. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an interested person, uh, Bruce Hodeschild. Bruce. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Longley, and thanks for not calling me an interesting person. A lot of people call me an interesting person, so, you know, I am an interest. Um, I, I was curious, and, um, um, you know, the, as, as, um, as um, Patrick mentioned, you know, this is um, one set, but since the, uh, since the revisions to the Eastern San Joaquin order um, and the passage of SB 200 and the SAFER program, the State Water Board has put up some tools, some GIS tools, one specifically on domestic well trend monitoring and the other on aquifer risk assessment, uh, which look at nitrates, which is largely what this is focused on. And so I don't know, and, and uh, just curious if how, how those tools and those results integrate with uh, the data that's being collected uh, from on-farm drinking water well programs. But... That's where um, I know little information about that in terms of, I think a lot of that is USGS information. Um, so it does go through qualified laboratories, uh, but it is done in kind of these uh, one mile plots, like square mile plots. So, um, you're getting a certain amount of wells within a certain area to give you an average concentration. Um, but that would probably be a great question for the state water board um, in terms of being able to use that data. Right, a lot of work and a lot of money is going into sampling and we want to get the biggest bang for the buck that we can out of it. So I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, an issue that needs to, we need to continue discussing and find various ways to um, ring as much information as we can out, out of the data. Um, of course, coming from academia, I think that those would make good uh, master degree program topics. Um, you're always looking for things to give students to work on, but um, in a more serious vein, uh, we, we need to see within the program how, how we can better use that data uh, to uh, develop, quite frankly, information that will help us uh, uh, regulate better in the future. Uh, if all of this is shallow, uh, you know, that's one thing. If, if we've got some deeper waters that are impacted, then, then that's, and I suspect we do in various locations, uh, then, you know, that's another matter. And, and, and you have to regulate that somewhat differently. Uh, the other part of that is where we're encountering these waters, is that water being pumped by agriculture also? Because one of the ways, you know, this nitrate is a nutrient. And if, it, if, that, if, if that aquifer is being actively pumped for agriculture also, then it's going on crops. And uh, that's part of their nitrogen budget. So, you know, just, just to be able to have a grasp of, of, the, of, of what's out there, and, and how we best regulate it, uh, how it's best managed, I think uh, that makes it very important that we find a, a way to better bring information uh, out of data. Data is not information. You, you, need to, you, you need to put that data against various parameters to be able to answer questions. When you, that, that's information. Okay, is, are there any other questions or comments? I just want to piggyback on uh, Dr. Uh, Lonely's comment earlier. Um, <clears throat> do we have data on the depth of the wheels? Um, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, because I'm curious uh, if the new standard for new wheels depth is a lot deeper. I would think it is. And I wonder if that makes any difference in comparison to older wills, depth versus newer uh, wills with the different depths or get different results. 
I, I don't know if that make any sense or 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 you know uh, put that into our survey. Um, and I, I think we should remember in terms of the the state water board's petition order that the, the real purpose behind this was to really identify the wells that have nitrate concentrations exceeding the drinking water standard and then to notify those users. So it, it was more of a, you know, where's a bad well, making sure that the people that were using that knew that, you know, the potential health risk with drinking that water. So as the program grows, this is something, again, we're getting good data for, for nitrate and groundwater, um, but currently our main focus is making sure that people are notified when there is an exceedance. And I might add, it adds cost to the program if you start describing the well. Uh, that's not always the easiest data to get, particularly for the older wells. Okay, any further comments or Thank questions? You. Hearing none, um, I want to thank you very much. Very interesting um, presentation, and I'm sure you'll be back in front of us in the future as you move into uh, uh, Southern Tulare County and Kern County. And Denise and I have particular interest in that area. So we, we, we'll have a particular interest in your data. Um, Thank, thank you very much once again. And we'll move on to uh, agenda item number 10. The executive officer's annual report to the board, fiscal year 2021. Uh, Patrick, about how long will this take? It's about an hour. That's usual. I'll tell you what, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. All right, sounds good. <laughs> so we'll be back here at, uh, let's say uh, quarter to 12. Are you going to run that, Patrick?
Gene, if you could verify that that screen is being shared. I can see it, Patrick. All right, sounds good. So you have some knee issues? Oh, I'm... Um... Okay, I'm showing 11.45. Uh, are you ready to go, Patrick? Ready to go. Very good. This is agenda item 10. This time the executive officer will provide his annual report to the board. This is an information item only and no action will be taken. Although the board may ask questions, provide direction to staff. Following the presentation, interested persons will be allowed three minutes each to address the board. And we'll now hear the executive officer's annual report. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Longley. Um, again, 
According to our portfolio management process, we go through a cycle whereby uh, we develop annual work plans, we uh, check in with the board to get input on the uh, priorities for all the water quality programs, we execute those priorities, and then we come back to the board every August to let you know how we did uh, and, and what we accomplished in the course of the past year. Um, that's this report that I'm giving right now. Let me see if we're clicking through this. So I just want to, uh, today I'm going to provide a quick overview of the 19 water quality programs, their goals and accomplishments from the past year, and provide a case highlight for each of the programs. But if you want the place where all of this information is readily available, minus the case highlights, here's where you can find it, along with the resources, so the types of personnel commitments we make to each one of the programs and priorities, which again are discussed in the December of each year. So just go to our Web page, click that programs button and go to the overview of the board programs. Uh, the website is at the bottom here. That's where you can find all the good stuff, probably one of the most useful pages that we have on our entire web page. With that, I will just launch right into it to talk about the 19 water quality programs. I'll note that uh, we previously kind of phrased it as 18 water quality programs. CV Salt is kind of under the basin planning program, but due to the fact that it's got a very, very specific and large workload, um, we're calling it out as a specific water quality program. Uh, and so that brings the number up to 19. So first, the permitting programs, and those include the NPDES program, the Waste Discharge to Land program, the Water Quality Certification program, and the Stormwater program. First up, the NPDES program. The goals of the program is to regulate point source discharges to protect beneficial uses and, where appropriate, consider the cost of compliance when developing permit conditions. This past year, the NPDES program continued to see success with a workload leveling effort that let us keep pace with the pace of permit renewals, a key focus of US EPA oversight of our program. We also continue to develop ways of ensuring our, our permits were consistent with the new statewide toxicity provisions. For a case highlight, I can point to the Echo Water Project. This past year, the NPDES program saw the completion of a major milestone for our biggest permittee. The Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant, located in Elk Grove, makes up more than 60% of all wastewater treatment plant discharges to the Delta. In 2010, the board adopted requirements that required the plant to implement tertiary filtration and biological nutrient removal, or BNR. To meet these new requirements, Regional Sand began implementing the Echo Water Project with an initial cost estimate of $1.5 to $2.1 billion. Regional Sand recently reported the tertiary filtration upgrades are currently ahead of schedule and in April 2021, the facility began to fully implement the BNR facilities that you can see in that picture in your top right. This has resulted in a reduction of more than 30,000 pounds of ammonia per day discharged to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. The figure shows a significant reduction in ammonia loading in the discharge since July of 2018, and it goes almost to zero with that nitrifying side stream and full BNR operation. This is also part of a bigger story. In 2000, virtually none of the Delta wastewater treatment facilities provided nutrient removal. However, due to board requirements, most of the Delta municipalities have been upgrading their facilities to provide advanced treatment. Today, 99.8% of the wastewater discharged to the Delta is treated to remove nutrients. Next, we have the Waste Discharge to Land Program, which primarily regulates waste discharges that may affect groundwater quality. This program is the oldest state water quality control program and regulates sewage treatment facilities, food processing facilities, and under other industries that discharge non-hazardous wastes. The program currently regulates a whopping 1,400 facilities. The program accomplishes its work by expediting the issuance of new or revised permits, seeking out unpermitted dischargers, developing new general orders, and is one of the main programs that is tasked with CV Salt's implementation. 
This past year, they completed numerous permitting actions and enrollments and reviewed a daunting amount of technical reports. This past year, the Waste Discharge to Land Program was also tasked with assisting in a major state water board effort. To better understand the impacts of PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFOS and PFOA, the State Board issued a monitoring order to 102 publicly owned treatment works in the Central Valley. Board permitting staff reviewed and provided comments on 53 PFOS groundwater work plans. That's a subset of the 102 POTWs were required to study groundwater in addition to their surface water discharges or if they didn't have a surface water discharge. This represents a major step forward in helping the state's understanding of the impacts of these chemicals, and it would not have been possible without the input from Central Valley Water Board permitting staff in the Waste Discharge to Land Program. Next, we have the Water Quality Certifications Program. This program protects wetlands, riparian areas, and headwaters. Projects regulated by this program generally require a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which requires a state certification issued pursuant to Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. These certifications have enforceable provisions to ensure that the projects meet state water quality requirements. The Water Quality Certifications Program is also responsible for implementing the state and federal wetlands no net loss policies and the state water board's new dredge and fill procedures. This past year, the Water Quality Certifications Program was able to review over 200 project applications and issue close to 300 actions, so some of those applications had multiple actions under them. Program staff participated in the interagency review team for the Central Valley in lieu fee program and continue to develop a general permit for maintenance dredging, which is a significant undertaking. Staff were also key to the development of the Placer County Conservation Program. After 20 plus years of development, in November 2020, the board adopted three programmatic general certifications and waste discharge requirements in support of the PCCP. The PCCP covers approximately 201,000 acres of western Placer County and is designated to accommodate the planned land development in the area while ensuring that environmental protections will support the survival and well being of hundreds of plant and animal species. 50,000 to 60,000 acres within the potential acquisition area will become part of a reserve system. This conservation reserve system would preserve many acres of vernal pool habitat, approximately 50% of the county's remaining stock of these fragile seasonal ecosystems will be protected by this single PCCC, PCCP program. In April 2021, the PCCP received its final regulatory approval and received direction to begin implementation within Western Placer County. I believe Stephanie Tadlock from our team, who you heard give some presentations to the board, was among those uh, at the, the uh, consummation ceremony. Next, the stormwater program. The stormwater program implements construction, industrial, and municipal permits to regulate the discharge of pollutants and stormwater to waters of the U.S. These permits require implementation of best management practices or BMPs and other program elements and controls to minimize the discharge of pollutants. Board staff review monitoring and other program reports, conduct compliance inspections and audits, and conduct enforcement actions as needed. This past year, stormwater staff were prolific in conducting inspections, as you can see from the numbers here, and participated in multi-agency trash cleanups, supported post-wildfire sediment and erosion control measures and assessments, and coordinated implementation of elements of the pyrethroids control program that pertain to stormwater. One key project that illustrates what the stormwater program does is the Market Center and Block 7 project, which is an affordable housing and revitalization development located in downtown Reading. In June of 2018, the California Strategic Growth Council awarded $20 million in grant funding for this project. The development includes housing units, 75% of which will be affordable housing, retail and office space, and multiple public parking structures. Sustainable transportation improvements are also part of the project and include over a half mile of sidewalks, approximately four miles of bike lanes, and a bike share program. 
Project challenges have included implementing and maintaining best management practices to prevent sediment and erosion discharges. During a storm event in May of 2020, as you see here, the Central Valley Water Board inspected the site in response to a complaint regarding sediment tracking. The discharger responded immediately and took corrective action to clean up the tracked material and deploy additional BMPs and has been diligent in complying with permit requirements. The project's revitalization of downtown Reading and the development of affordable housing is important to this community that faced devastation and housing shortages following the 2018 car fire. Nonetheless, diligent oversight by the regional board is needed to ensure that projects like this don't have deleterious impacts on water resources. Next, the four programs under the planning, monitoring and assessment program group. These include the Basin Planning Program, under which the TMDL Program and the Delta Program are managed, the CV Salts Program, which I mentioned earlier is being called out as an individual program this year, the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program, or SWAMP, and the Nonpoint Source Program. Water quality control plans, or basin plans, provide the foundation for all Central Valley Water Board regulatory actions. The TMDL and Delta programs also fall within the Greater Basin Planning Program, which also provides some oversight for CV salts. The goals of the planning program are to establish policies to preserve and enhance water quality and protect beneficial uses, conduct triennial reviews every three years to ensure that the basin plans address public concerns and continue to be effective at meeting program goals, and to protect and restore surface waters by conducting water quality assessments to identify impairments and by establishing implementation plans, including total maximum daily load plans under the Federal Clean Water Act to address those impairments. As the unit that also oversees the Delta program, the Basin Planning Program is responsible for coordinating actions to ensure protection of Delta water quality. This past year, the planning program developed region-wide assessment work plan focused on the evaluation of biostimulatory and biointegrity impacts, supported efforts for the 2018, 2020 slash 2022, and 2024 integrated reports. So that's actually three separate reports. The, the naming conventions are a little odd, but three separate integrated reports. The planning program also continued implementation of existing priority TMDL and related control programs and continued work on the Delta Nutrient Research Plan and with the Delta Regional Monitoring Program. The Delta program has allocated resources to address harmful algal blooms in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. HABs are a key component of the Delta Nutrient Research Plan or NRP and projects are focused on filling high priority data gaps. Board staff are also implementing the Freshwater and Estuarine HABs program, which includes bloom response, monitoring, and building partnerships with local stakeholders. Ongoing projects provide information on bloom initiation and sources, potential risks for human health, trophic transfer of cyanotoxins to food webs, stressors for native fish, and possible mitigation methods to alleviate blooms and cyanotoxins. Board staff have been collaborating and developing partnerships with several organizations and local residents who are also focused on these priorities, including in Discovery Bay and on the Stockton waterfront. The HAB initiation project is investigating if microcystis blooms throughout the Delta are generated by benthic resting cells, microcystis cells that overwinter at the sediment surface, from a few select locations. The project monitoring cyanotoxin concentrations of benthic organisms and water samples includes 10 sampling locations and organisms include clams, crayfish, and smaller sediment dwelling animals. The pilot mitigation development project, which is pretty cool, utilized experiments to optimize treatment of HABs using hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has many advantages since it degrades to molecular oxygen in water leaves no chemical residue and could potentially degrade cyanotoxins, thus alleviating and alleviate low dissolved oxygen issues that often result when cyanobacterial blooms deteriorate. The field study will determine the potential for use of this management approach in Discovery Bay and other water bodies where the addition of algicides that leave residual chemicals or nutrients is particularly undesirable. 
Aerial photos here are of Discovery Bay on the left. It's a particularly uh, interesting hotspot for Habs. And the Stockton waterfront on the right, um, photo credits go to Lisa and Joe Brzezinski and Discovery Bay residents on the left. And the San Francisco Baykeeper, courtesy of Lighthawk, that took that. Uh, it's actually a video that you can, you can see uh, of the Stockton waterfront. Next up, the CV Salts Program. The Central Valley Salinity Alternatives for Long-Term Sustainability Initiative is a stakeholder-driven effort that has developed a regulatory framework to address legacy and ongoing salt and nitrate accumulation in the valley. The goals of the program are to ensure safe drinking water supplies, to reduce salt and nitrate loading to protect beneficial uses, and to implement long-term managed restoration of impaired water bodies. In this past year, Revisions to the salt and nitrate control program were adopted by the Central Valley Water Board and approved by the State Water Board. Notices to comply for the salt control program were mailed out and preliminary management zone proposals and early action plans were received and reviewed with implementation of both beginning in May of 2021. One particularly notable accomplishment in addition to the nitrate measures that you've been hearing about so much is the notice to comply mail out. The notice to comply mail out for the salt control program was a huge undertaking, even larger than the nitrate control program mail out since all salinity dischargers in the Central Valley needed to receive a notice in order to kick off the program. On January 5th of 2021, staff who had been preparing for this for months sent out over 3,200 customized notice to comply letters for the salt control program to permittees throughout the Central Valley region. In the subsequent weeks, staff fielded hundreds of calls and emails from permittees and consultants. Staff coordinated with lead staff from other programs to ensure that each inquiry was provided a timely response and a high degree of customer service. Staff also participated in or coordinated numerous outreach and informational events to help inform permittees of the new requirements. And special thanks go out to Cindy Ah Young, True Kang, and Walt Plakta that recently retired Walt Plakta uh, for all of their efforts coordinating this massive undertaking. Next up is the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program or SWAMP. This was created to fulfill the legislative mandate for a unifying program that would coordinate all surface water quality monitoring conducted by the state and regional water boards. The SWAP program conducts water quality monitoring directly and through collaborative partnerships and provides numerous reports, fact sheets, and tools, all designed to support water resource management here in California. Swamp monitoring projects assess overall water quality status and trends, identify water quality problems and potential sources, and evaluate program effectiveness. This past year, Swamp program staff conducted a phase one of a bacteria source identification study in the Lower American River, supported HAB incident response monitoring, and deployed continuous temperature loggers to support the board's climate change work plan. The case highlight is actually even a little bit more fun than that. The swamp staff supported the recreational beneficial use studies in the upper San Joaquin River and the lower Kings River watersheds. Every summer since 2007, swamp staff have monitored E. coli in swimming holes as an indicator of potential fecal pollution and recreational safety. To date, Swamp and its partners have collected nearly 3,000 samples from 172 recreational sites. This past year, Fresno Swamp staff conducted and continued to monitor popular recreation areas in the upper portion of the San Joaquin River watershed. In addition, staff added in sites in the Lower Kings River watershed. To keep the public and local agency partners informed about current conditions, Swamp is continuing to post weekly E. coli results to an interactive online map. And thanks go out to camera, Cameron Alfing, Christopher Gonzalez, and Samira Galdari, who all uh, participated in this effort. Uh, I will say many days that looks more like where I'd rather be rather than in the office. Now the Nonpoint Source Program. Nonpoint source pollution is the leading cause of water quality impairments in California. 
Leveraging limited grant funds, the Nonpoint Source Program works to restore waters impacted by nonpoint source pollution and to protect unimpaired water bodies by assessing problem sources and implementing management programs. This past year, NPS staff obtained phosphorus load information for the Clear Lake TMDL, participated in the Clear Lake Blue Ribbon Committee, coordinated campfire recovery projects, and completed annual updates to the list of surface waters with surface water quality monitor management plans or SQMPs and their status for pesticide TMDLs, irrigated lands regulatory program or ILRP pesticide management plans, and for the San Joaquin River Selenium TMDL. NPS staff also continued to work on the Battle Creek watershed based plan. The Battle Creek watershed is an important salmonid fishery and hosts spawning, rearing, and migratory habitats for threatened and endangered salmonid species. In May of 2019, the watershed based plan was completed to address sediment impacts and other water quality uncertainties within the watershed. The watershed based plan had identified several short term and several long term needs to reduce sediment impacts to surface water within the watershed and to guide decision making efforts within the watershed. Several sediment reduction projects have been identified and have secured grant funding for completion, including a newly executed grant in the amount of $603,654 for road decommissioning in the South Fork of Battle Creek. Additionally, a data portal was created to store the watershed based plan and other relevant Battle Creek watershed data and information. This data portal is hosted on the Sacramento River Watershed Program website, sacriver.org, and can also be accessed on the Battle Creek website, battlecreek.opennrm.org. In addition to hosting watershed based plan information, the data portal also allows users to visualize available watershed data and create user-specific maps from various stakeholder databases. These are also some examples of some of the sediment delivery projects, uh, mitigation projects within the watershed, rocker armoring to protect erosive soils during rainfall events, even though these pictures are obviously from the dry season. Um, and much thanks to George Lowe, who's been working on this project um, ever since joining the NPS team. Next up, the administrative program. The regional board employs approximately 250 permanent employees and 40 temporary or part-time employees. Of those staff, 18 serve as our administrative section team. The administrative support program provides administrative support and is responsible for activities that are related to budget projection and tracking, contract grant development and management, procurement, managing laboratory services, record keeping, billing, personal and human resources, recruitment, physical distribution of mail and electronic content, managing the vehicle fleet, and logistics. This past year, admin staff processed and reconciled over 1,100 employee training requests, assisted in the production and remediation of over 1,000 documents to make them Americans for Disability uh, accessible, and assisted with and completed over 10,000 mailouts, even with COVID protocols in place. One case highlight, and this is too small for you to, to see intentionally, um, is the uh, ERPA process. Early in the pandemic, the State Water Board's Human Resource Branch established a new paperless electronic process for completing requests for personal action, or RPAs. These are essential for filling vacancies, for position reclassifications, and for employee transfers and for processing retirements. Each step of this process requires specific staff from administrative support to managers and supervisors, including myself, to complete certain steps to move the RPA through to completion. This electronic process allows for transparency and for the tracking of each step of the RPA through the reports, status, and archive views of the data, but the new electronic workflow model was far more complicated than the past process and was not subject to beta testing or really much training. Nonetheless, admin program staff learned this new paperless system, developed additional in-house training guides, and provided critical training to supervisors in an evolving virtual environment. During fiscal year 2021, program staff used this to process over 130 RPAs, so that's 130 hires or retires or, or reclassifications, 
and is anticipated that the number of RPAs will increase substantially over the next fiscal year. And a lot of credit goes out. You heard her receive uh, a Superior Accomplishment Award this morning to Brittany Elliott. Uh, she, this is the, the if you look, if, if you were able to see close enough, which I mean, for privacy purposes or not, um, she initiated just about every single one of these on this particular uh, uh, spreadsheet that I pulled up. Um, a lot of that information goes through her, Kelly Garver and Brett Braidman to process all of those uh, particular requests. Next up, the special permitting programs. These include the ILRP, the oil fields program, the land disposal program, confined animal facilities or dairies program, mines program, the cannabis program, and the forest activities program. In the Central Valley region, there are over 30,000 irrigated agricultural operations on over 6 million acres of land. The Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program regulates these operations to protect beneficial uses of surface and groundwater. ILRP program staff provide oversight of coalition and grower activities and conduct compliance and outreach activities to maximize grower enrollment and compliance. This past year, program staff updated eight ILRP general orders to include salt and nitrate control program requirements, approved 19 surface water quality management plan completions, meaning that they've solved 19 water quality programs in specific watershed areas, expanded the on-farm drinking water well monitoring program, as you heard earlier today, and approved a groundwater protection formula methodology, which is key to protecting groundwater from nitrates. Now, one thing that was completed this past year that was incredibly important was the completion of the East San Joaquin Expert Panel Review. In 2012, the Central Valley Water Board adopted the East San Joaquin General Order to regulate pollutants from agricultural lands in the East San Joaquin watershed. Environmental groups petitioned the State Water Board assessing that surface water, uh, asserting that a surface water monitoring programs did not effectively show if water quality objectives were going to be met. In response, the State Water Board directed the Central Valley Water Board to implement an independent expert review of the surface water monitoring framework. Board staff contracted with the Southern California Coastal Watershed Research Project, or SQUIRP, to facilitate and administer the external expert review, and a stakeholder advisory group was formed to assist with the selection of a five-member expert panel. The slides here are from a field tour that the expert panel took of specific areas in the watershed, accompanied by board staff and some of the petitioners that were challenging the order. During 2020, the expert panel was convened and the external review was conducted. This included three public panel meetings and multiple opportunities for public comments. The final findings and recommendations report was submitted in December of 2020 and brought to the Central Valley Water Board in February of 2021. The expert panel found that the overall East San Joaquin surface water monitoring framework met the ILRP regulatory requirements and made several recommendations to improve the monitoring program. This review was essential to the legitimacy of the board's irrigated lands regulatory program. And much thanks to Susan Fregain, uh, who was the lead on this really complicated project. Next, the oil fields program. Most California oil production occurs here in the Central Valley. Formation water produced with the oil, known as produced wastewater, comprises the largest volume of waste generated by oil production. Produced wastewater is typically saline and is disposed of by land application, primarily ponds, or by underground injection. The oil field program regulates oil field discharges to ensure the protection of surface and groundwaters and reviews proposed aquifer exemption applications, UIC permits, and SB4 related groundwater monitoring programs to ensure activities are protective of water quality. This past year, the oil field program oversaw multiple pond closures, inspected 64 facilities, issued 44 UIC project review letters and reviewed nine SB4 applications, 12 SB4 groundwater monitoring plans and 10 SB4 groundwater monitoring reports. The program also brought the food safety expert panel white paper to the board for a final review. But we all, the oil field program also issued several 13267 informational orders, that's under water code section 13267, to better understand potential impacts due to the injection of oil field produced wastewater. 
A United States Geological Survey publication revealed that injected fluids from injection wells completed in the Tulare Formation in portions of Lost Hills, North Bell Ridge, and South Bell Ridge oil fields may have migrated outside of areas of the aquifer that have been exempted from the protections of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. The USGS publication concluded that groundwater in the Tulare Formation has been impacted by the injection of produced water for the purpose of waste disposal, but was unable to determine the lateral extent of these impacts. Board staff issued five orders under Water Code Section 13267, requiring operators in these fields to investigate and determine the lateral and vertical extent of potential impacts. In response to the orders, operators have proposed to prepare site conceptual hydrogeological characterization reports. To date, four reports have been submitted and are being reviewed by board staff. And a lot of thanks to Doug Wachtel, uh, who is the key oil fields program uh, lead for this, for this undertaking. The land disposal program regulates the land discharge of solid and liquid waste to prevent water quality impacts. Its goals are to protect groundwater and surface water quality from contaminants associated with landfills, liquid waste surface impoundments, and other waste containment units, ensure permits are kept up to date with applicable regulations, and implement timely enforcement where necessary. This past year, the Land Disposal Program presented eight individual permits for the board's consideration, enrolled additional dischargers under the composting general order, and conducted 23 permitting and construction-related inspections. One major new permit developed by the Land Disposal Program was the waste discharge requirements for the White Rock North Dump and Aerojet Waste Consolidation Unit in Sacramento County. In late 2019, staff were approached by Aerojet Rocketdyne regarding a proposal to build a new Class II landfill that would be used to contain up to 1 million cubic yards of waste soil and inert construction debris from the Aerojet landfill and various soil cleanup projects at the Aerojet Superfund site. The proposed Aerojet Waste Consolidation Unit would be located on top of a portion of the White Rock North Dump, a pre-regulation dump that had never received proper closure. Adoption of WRs would provide for the closure of the White Rock North Dump and a 97% reduction in truck traffic that would have been used to truck the waste to various landfills within the Central Valley region. For your information, building atop the old dump was technically complicated, but preferable to the establishment of a new landfill. Board staff worked very closely with the discharger, their various consultants, and local agencies throughout 2020 to facilitate a properly designed waste management unit and adoption of the associated waste discharge requirements. This project will allow for the redevelopment of valuable property for commercial use within the county, relocate waste from an unlined landfill to a lined unit, offering greater water quality protection, consolidate impacted soil that may be contributing to groundwater contamination from various parts of the Superfund site, and facilitate a proper cover over that old dump that was never appropriately closed. Next, the Confined Animals Program. The Central Valley is home to a variety of agricultural operations that rely on animals, cows, steer, sheep, goats, pigs, and poultry. Confined animal facilities are ranches where livestock are held and provided food for a significant part of the time. The goal of the Confined Animal Facilities Program is to ensure the human right to safe, clean, and affordable and accessible water by protecting waters potentially affected by discharges from confined animal facilities while preserving the benefits of a healthy and sustainable livestock industry. This past year, staff developed a process for confined animal facilities to participate as members of a third-party industry groups in CV Salts, conducted 291 inspections, some of which were done by uh, Sean, who received the award this morning, issued four formal enforcement orders for off-property discharges from dairies or for over-applying to land application areas, and reviewed and commented on several remediation work plans from dairies in areas of shallow groundwater. The project highlight for this year is dairy digesters. Confined animal facilities program staff participated in a technical advisory committee for evaluating and ranking grant proposals for dairy digesters. This effort is in support of the California Air Resource Board's plan for reducing short-lived climate pollutants particularly methane, 
to address the impact of climate change. In the past five years, nearly 200 million of cap and trade money has been granted to fund the design and construction of approximately 120 new dairy digesters in the Central Valley. Each project involves a detailed review of a design report for the digester and pond liner and review of a post-construction report, which in addition to the engineering aspects of the installation, includes an operation and maintenance plan and a monitoring and reporting plan to detect leakage. Last fiscal year, staff reviewed approximately 50 dairy digester design reports and completed approximately 40 post-construction report reviews to ensure that the digesters funded by the grant program are designed and built to specifications that are protective of water quality. Next, the mines program. Central Valley Water Board staff regulate 106 mine sites with known or potential water quality impacts. This is a subset of the 47,000 abandoned mine features with physical and or environmental hazards identified through California by the Department of Conservation. Discharges of waste from these mine sites can have devastating effects on receiving waters and can significantly limit or obliterate beneficial uses for miles downstream. The goal of the mines program is to eliminate surface water and groundwater impacts from past mining operations and prevent further degradation of waters of the state. This past year, mine program staff inspected 23 mines to assess site conditions, updated the board's approach to ranking the water quality threat posed by the 106 mines, and issued multiple permit amendments and renewals to enhance water quality protections for certain mine sites. Mine staff also worked on a particularly difficult situation involving the Bully Hill and Rising Star Mines, which are abandoned copper mines along the Squaw Creek arm of Shasta Lake. Rising Star Mine is the mine in this picture. Extensive remediation was conducted, including the installation of bulkhead seals, consolidation and capping of waste rock at the Rising Star Mine, as shown here, and the diversion of Town Creek around the Bully Hill waste rock pile. In 2009, however, the bankruptcy of the property owner, Lyondell Chemical Company, resulted in the formation of the Lyondell Trust to manage $8 million for remedial activities. Between 2011 and present, the Lyondell Trust funded the construction of two passive treatment systems that we hoped would have eliminated a lot of the water quality impacts. However, funds are running out and the mines are still impacting the waterways. Staff requested that the trust evaluate projects that could be implemented with the remaining funds. The major projects recommended by the assessment include improvements to the Rising Star bypass channel and the Rising Star culvert system, erosion next to the containment structures in this picture, to accommodate a 100-year storm event. Implementation of the recommended project is expected to harden the mine site by providing long-term protection of the Rising Star waste rock containment cell and passive treatment system. In the center of this picture is the Rising Star spillway channel that will be hardened to prevent additional erosion. This isn't a perfect solution, but one that mitigates a significant source of pollution until the state finds a way to finance more extensive cleanup of the many mine sites like this one. And special thanks goes out to Stacy Gotham, who worked with the mine uh, program uh, to figure out what the solutions were with the limited funding available for these sites. Next is the cannabis program. The Central Valley Water Board's cannabis regulatory program regulates waste discharges associated with cannabis cultivation. The program's goals are to increase enrollments in the statewide general order, perform targeted enforcement in high value watersheds, continue education and outreach to cultivators, and to coordinate with other agencies at the state and local level. This past year, the cannabis program enrolled 444 cultivators, conducted 13 outreach events, 16 compliance inspections, and 29 enforcement inspections, and got two administrative civil liability orders adopted. Cannabis permitting staff also conducted a major effort and enrollment in Lake County, which is one of the few permissive counties in our region. In mid-2020, the County of Lake issued a moratorium that reads, County of Lake 
will not accept cannabis permit applications unless the property associated uh, is enrolled in the applicable water quality protection programs by October 31, 2020. This caused a huge influx of applications to the board. You had to have your board permit if you're gonna be allowed to grow cannabis and you had to have it quickly. In order to process the influx and the dozens of questions that came in, staff drafted a frequently asked questions document that would automatically reply to the email sent from the outside the organization to a dedicated email address. This document has since grown and is invaluable resource for saving time in reoccurring customer service interactions. Staff also evaluated the enrollment process and notice of applicability preparation process to eliminate all unnecessary steps. And this effort involved a coordinated effort with the Reading and Rancho Cordova offices and with Lake County. Before September 2020, the Central Valley Water Board had 191 Lake County paid applicants and enrollees. By October 31, just a couple months later, there were 446 enrollees in Lake County. Much thanks to Janae Fried, who is the key staff person involved in this effort. And these picks are of a grow in Lakeport, and the lake is right over the horizon, and the, the grow house is in Middleton. Unfortunately, I believe that was impacted by fire. I'm not sure that one is around anymore, um, such as the nature of, of growing in that area. Next is the Forest Activities Program. The Forest Activities Program seeks to prevent impacts to surface waters due to discharges of pollutants related to forest land management practices. These include sediment, petroleum project, products, pesticides and herbicides, and other waste materials in accordance with the state's 2004 non-point source implementation policy. This past year, staff conducted 312 inspections, executed and provided technical expertise for nine grants or contracts aimed at improving forest lands and watersheds with legacy logging impacts, developed prior a prioritization tool for staff use to evaluate the need for field inspections for post-fire and utility vegetation management activities, and continued to work on a new permit for activities conducted by the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Staff also continued work on a forest practice program pesticide sampling project. In 2013, program staff began testing new passive and pumping sampling technology that allows for samples to be collected over longer periods of time. Initial goals included evaluating product design and producing a sampling protocol that would allow staff to monitor for multiple pesticides over a period of multiple days or weeks. Early testing resulted in multiple pesticide detections, but provided no corresponding and reliable concentration data. Program staff subsequently assisted in the development of a new laboratory methodology based off the work of the United States Geological Survey that allows for assessment of up to 155 current use pesticides, including many commonly related to cannabis cultivation and forest management activities. Staff is now working with the State Water Board's Environmental Lab Accreditation Program, or ELAP, to validate and achieve accreditation for the resulting methodology. In this picture, staff are preparing to deploy a passive sampler into North Salt Creek in Shasta County. Program staff has, have coordinated with our currently contracted labs to use existing methodologies that allow for limited sampling while the final ELAP methodology is being accredited. Here, staff are working with CAL FIRE to retrieve passive samplers during the winter. These samplers were deployed for 14 days and they needed to be pulled rain or snow. And here, you can see one of the passive samplers called a chem catcher up close. Much thanks to Matt Boone, a senior environmental scientist in our Reading office who really helped make this project possible. Last but certainly not least are the enforcement and cleanup programs, including the compliance and enforcement program, the site cleanup program, and the underground storage tank program. The State Water Resources Control Board and the nine regional water quality control boards protect the waters of the state by ensuring compliance with clean water laws and taking enforcement actions when violations occur. The goals of the Compliance and Enforcement Program include protecting water quality by enforcing state and federal laws and policies, and take swift and fair enforcement actions, conduct inspections, respond to complaints, identify unpermitted sites, 
and apply technical expertise to ensure enforceable permits that are protective of water quality. This past year, compliance and enforcement staff conducted 1,570 inspections, issued 1,414 enforcement actions, collaborated with the City of Sacramento and other watershed partners on the cleanup of Steelhead Creek, and issued a $2.5 million penalty to address illicit discharges to Mule Creek from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. One example of the type of actions the Compliance and Enforcement Program undertakes is an ACL to the City of Jackson, California Department of Transportation, or Caltrans, and the Central Coast Financial Group. This order addresses a sewage spill to, to Jackson Creek by assessing a penalty in the amount of $203,000. Uh, this case stems from an incident in February of 2018 when a sewer line was damaged during overnight construction during the repair of a Caltrans storm drain lines across Highway 49 in Jackson. That's in this picture. Miscommunications and utility marking failures were to blame for this 57,000 gallon spill, which occurred due to a broken main, which is circled here. Because the city of Jackson is designated as a community with financial hardship, the city of Jackson, Caltrans, and CCFG construction were allowed to direct payment to the city's wastewater collection system in lieu of directing the funds to the cleanup and abatement account. Using these funds, the city will provide grant funding to homeowners to replace aging private lateral lines and to improve some existing lines, which offers further protection to Jackson Creek, which is the water body shown here. Much thanks to Mohammed Farhad and Michael Fisher who were instrumental in documenting the incident and negotiating the settlement. The Site Cleanup Program regulates and oversees the investigation and cleanup of contaminated sites. Staff overseeing investigation and cleanup actions at sites that have been impacted by releases of pollutants to soil, soil gas, groundwater, surface water, sediments, and indoor air. Site cleanup program sites include large industrial facilities, military bases, oil refineries, factories, and smaller facilities such as dry cleaners and metal plating shops. Many properties are in urban areas and environmental justice communities and cleanup often results in contaminant removal, reduced impact to water and economic growth. This past year, cleanup staff conducted technical review of over 1000 site investigation, remediation and remedial design documents. Staff continued efforts to identify sites eligible for grants through the site cleanup subaccount program and to reduce site backlog in GeoTracker. One cleanup site that exemplifies the work of the cleanup program is the former community linen site, a solvent cleanup site in Sacramento. The source of the PCE contamination is from a steam laundry facility that operated from 1957 to 1985. After buying the property between 1985 and 2007, SMUD demolished the community linen building, removed the PCE contaminating, uh, containing storage tank, and ultimately converted the property to a parking lot with a solar charging station. The board began working on the project in 2013 after a property investigation at a nearby site showed that solvents were still present. Investigations have delineated PCE and TCE in soil, soil vapor, and groundwater. A final remedial action plan was approved in March of 2021 following the distribution of a public fact sheet and virtual public meeting. Construction of the remedial systems will begin this summer. This case illustrates the value of both strong technical oversight of cleanup efforts, but also of involving the community and of getting public involvement in the cleanup efforts so that the public understands the risk posed by the sites and the approved method of cleaning the site up. Last but not least, the underground storage tank and above ground storage tank program that addresses leak prevention, provides oversight of leaking underground tank cleanups, and facilitates reimbursement to responsible parties conducting those cleanups. The goal of the program is to protect the public and the environment from the effects of unauthorized releases from USTs through the investigation and mitigation of released constituents. This past year, UST staff moved nine stalled cases into active remediation, we reviewed 90% of our open cases for possible closure, a total of 496 cases, and closed 63 cases after finding that there was no further risk to the environment or public health. 
Frank's one stop in Manteca is a priority case because multiple domestic wells were impacted with the chemical constituent MTBE. We put it into the Emergency Abandoned and Recalcitrant uh, Program or EAR program after the site's $1.5 million UST cleanup fund money was expended and there was no viable responsible party to fund additional work. Impacted well owners, like the owner of this residence, were offered a connection to a newly installed city of Manteca water main. Our goal was to connect the residences to the city of Manteca's water main and destroy the associated impacted domestic wells. Out of the proposed 15 residences, nine agreed to accept water connections and destroy their wells, and one owner of a vacant property agreed to just have their well destroyed. By the end of this year, all well destructions and water connections have been completed, except for one water connection, which should be finished soon. Through the EAR program, board staff were able to find a source of affordable and safe drinking water for several residents of a disadvantaged community and remove well conduits to groundwater. And that concludes my rundown of all the board's programs and the 19 board programs, uh, some case highlights from all of them, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I think the key word is uh, highlights. Uh, a tremendous amount of work goes on and, um, and it's, it's essential and, and good work. Um, <coughs> I think when we talk about permits and, and water in the Central Valley in Region 5, we have to remember a lot of our water is exported outside of um, Central Valley for drinking water for elsewhere in the state of California. So we are very, very important insofar as providing a, a, a safe source of drinking water for folks, not only in this valley, but elsewhere in California. Um, on the mines program, you know, I'm, I'm really bothered by the fact that at some time, not too distant future, we're going to see Iron Mountain possibly having funding issues. And um, certainly all the mines that other mines that we have that have issues. And I think of the, some of the mines that are over on the east side that have arsenic issues that um, we really don't have both the funding and to some degree, the technology to be able to address those issues. Um, at a point, I think we need to sit down and, and do some deep thinking on, on how we might better those future problems, because um, as time goes by, they don't uh, take care of themselves. We need, to, we, we, need to, we need to come up with a strategy, I think, that we don't really have right now. Um, once again, great work. If you go on and talk about it all day long, and uh, uh, I think, though, are there any other board members wishing to make comment at this time? I have uh, one interesting person. I, guess. I have something, Dr. Longley. I go, go ahead, Nick. Um, so thanks again, Patrick. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a lot and certainly a great overview and, and certainly underscores the breadth and scope of, of oversight of the board, which is... That's like, a, drinking, that's, that's like drinking from a fire hose. Yes, and I continue to do so, but uh, it is with great enthusiasm that I do it. So um, if I may focus r r right in on the Irrigated Lands Program, and this is related to um, the conversation earlier in the agenda, but I, you know, we didn't really talk about it then, but I think it, it's related, obviously, to um, uh, resource allocation and sort of, uh, you know, process going forward. I mean, we, we did talk about uh, during that discussion about right, you know, looking at right sizing uh, regulatory programs that obviously justify uh, that right sizing. And, and um, you know, what, what does that look like from a process perspective? And what does that look like, you know, given everything else that, that staff has to do uh, from a resource allocation perspective. I mean, help help me wrap my head around process and staffing and what that effort would look like. Well, I, I will say, um, you know, we are not as flexible as many people may assume in terms of allocating and shifting staff resources into different program, program areas. Um, you know, that's kind of an, an evolution. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact 
Um, you know, you, you heard in our in the resolution that that uh, came from this morning. Um, you know, uh, 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 Brian Newman um, and and Alex too. Uh, they used to be area engineers. You know, essentially a a jack of all trades. Hey, if something comes up in this county related to water quality, you fix it. You know, you 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 work on it. And and we didn't even have kind of these these kind of areas of expertise for for staff to uh, for staff to do. That trend is completely the other direction now. Um, so we have very very regimented ways of allocating staff resources and and of kind of clearing staff duties and responsibilities through uh, numerous HR steps. Um, so if we want to shift resources from air, one area into another, it is a, a very detailed process. Um, and one that, you know, there's about 10 different vetoes by, by folks outside of our organization uh, before that that actually happens. And certainly we've made the case to do that. You know, we've, we've, we've kind of shifted things around uh, some of the administrative resources we've been successful at, at shifting around. Um, but when we talk about right sizing, like a project like the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, I think it's that's probably one of those areas where there is way too much to do. Uh, and our, our main challenge is to uh, see if we can cut down on, you know, projects that aren't doing much, you know, okay? cut down on those projects that aren't yielding a lot of results for the amount of time that we invest in those projects. Um, and, you know, there, I think it's, we do that and we try and constantly do that. And it's kind of been a, a mantra of mine because that's really the only way we keep, you know, uh, uh, costs down. You know, we, we are a fee funded agency. We are not, you know, I, I, I hear it all the time. You know, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of people that, that write me angry mail and they say you're a waste of taxpayer funds, waste of this, waste of that. And you know, I bite my tongue and, 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 and uh, but you know, in the back of my mind, I kind of say, hey, we're not really much taxpayer funded here. You know, we, we are funded by the fee payers. We're funded by all the rate payers throughout the, you know, the ag programs and the dairy programs and you know, the POTWs cut us massive checks every year. Um, and so I think we have to be responsible with the, with the use of those funds. Um, and, and I think it makes us, you know, try and be really, really uh, receptive to cost considerations when we, when we talk about our programs. And certainly there are those areas that, you know, we, we, we are inflexible on, you know, we have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, but where we do have flexibility, I think that's one of the reasons we brought that uh, program up uh, uh, in, at the first part of this board meeting is we want to continue to focus on those areas where we can have, you know, for lack of a better term, the biggest bang for the buck. And just kind of managing folks' expectations on that just out there. I mean, what does that process look like for some of these other areas? Again, I have no idea what areas we're talking about. You know, we've sort of ane anecdotally referred to the potential for other areas, you know, that might merit a, you know, a, a look, a further examination as to whether, you know, some uh, modification is, is justified. But just to manage expectations for folks, what, what does that look like from a process standpoint? Are those already being, and, and this is a, probably a little bit on the ignorance on my part, are these areas, have they been identified? Are these discussions ongoing? Is there a process that is engaged in that's been articulated, you know, uh, or is it more ad hoc, I guess? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to bluntly answer your question, it's, it's ad hoc um, because I think the answer really, you know, what, what we have in Goose Lake and kind of what I, what I mentioned earlier is, is really something special. And, and that you really can say, hey, there's there's really no water quality impacts uh, uh, due to these activities, and and that's that's pretty unique, right? Um, when you get from virtually zero to just a tiny bit of water quality impacts and some water quality impairments, that's a huge leap in terms of of taking somebody out of a regulatory program, and that means that you know at that stage you usually have to do you know some sequel work to modify the program. Um, I'll say our, our bill for the CEQA back in 2012 was, I think, about three and a half million dollars. Um, so if the, you know, the, the coalitions wanted to come up with, you know, a, another budget for inflation, another five million dollars to do that over again, you know, we could we could certainly consider it. But that that's a huge expense. We know nobody can easily kind of expend that. Um, and so we do it very delicately. And I think the answer, you know, the, the, the kind of way to bridge the gap while we kind of you know, amass everything and, and, you know, perhaps do a wholesale revision to these orders at some point in the future is to reduce 
the burdens of the program as much as possible in the interim. Um, so I think, you know, Sue uh, and uh, I, I mentioned Rebecca Tabor, but, but a lot of the other um, kind of managers within that program, Dana has a, has a hand in it, really look long and hard at the irrigated lands regulatory program and look for areas where we can reduce monitoring to the extent that we're able to, um, to, to you know, reduce the, the cost of the program. So that's kind of one of the big drivers uh, that we do in lieu of, of really completely reshaping the program, which is a, a huge, huge cost. I appreciate that. Obviously, um, appreciate going down that rabbit hole a little bit. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. Obviously, it's a lot, lot more there. But anyway, thanks. Uh, Dr. Longley. Well, some, some programs like, for instance, the issues we have going on now uh, with Iron Mountain Mine, um, there was a huge settlement that's paying for that. But, and as was mentioned for the other mine that Patrick mentions, uh, those monies run out. Uh, the Bully Hill Mine was the one he was talking about. Th those monies run out over a point of time. Um, we've taken advantage of all the deep pockets we can find and, and we're left with uh, how, how, how do we manage them after that? Now, of course, irrigated lands has a much greater impact probably than most of the mines do, although Iron Mountain has an unbelievable impact on the Sac River. Um, so, you know, those are the challenges and, the, and they're difficult. Are there any further comments? Yes, Dr. Longley, this is Roger. Yes, uh, Patrick, I just want to say I appreciate your report. It's always so thorough, but I think also it's I think it's so important for us to realize just how much the water board covers, what the regional board does. It's so vast and it's so detailed and it's a lot of work and our staff is just excellent at what they are doing and dealing with. And um, again, I appreciate the presentation. It was thorough, concise, and again, just gives us an, an idea when we wrap our heads around what we have to undertake and what our staff undertakes. So again, thank you for that. You're, you're, you're very welcome. I, I will say every year, the challenge for me is cutting this down to an hour. Um, it, it, the way it usually starts off of all the program managers, and I think they take a lot of pride in their programs. Um, and, and they're short bits. If I mashed them all together, I'd probably have a six or seven hour uh, presentation. So, you know, I, I usually spend a couple, almost a couple days solid okay. kind of cutting this thing down, looking at the numbers, figuring out what's most relevant um, and trying to present that to you because the, the breadth of what they, of what staff does is, is truly extraordinary. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're a relatively big organization. There's about 280 um, uh, full-time staff here. Um, but, you know, it, it, when you, when you actually talk about programs like like CV Salts, I think people actually assume that we're way bigger than we actually are. Um, you know, there's just a few people working on CV Salts behind the scenes. The Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program is just a couple dozen. You know, we only have a couple dozen of, of, of uh, folks involved in the dairy program and oversight and, you know, even smaller numbers for some of the stormwater. So um, th there's truly a, an outsized presence that we have. Um, and it's, it's largely because there's a lot of smart managers and a lot of smart staff that, that work to uh, leverage the resources the best they can uh, uh, to, to make the impact that they do. Any further comments? Yeah, Patrick, I would just echo what everybody said, but I, I especially appreciated the highlights that you uh, included in your presentation as examples. And um, you know, the SAC Regional Sand Project was one that stood out. And uh, I had some involvement in the Aerojet landfill relocation discussions uh, must have been over 12 years ago. So the wheels of the private sector grind pretty slowly <laughs> too, till they got to this solution. Um, so I'm glad to see some progress there. So yeah, thanks again. And uh, thanks to all the staff that work so hard. Mark, I'm glad you brought up uh, original San uh, a couple of decades ago when we started, as Patrick pointed out, the, the, uh, we've taken out most of the discharges of, of nutrients to, to, the, to the Delta uh, yes. in the meantime. But when we started out a couple of decades ago, you, you can't believe the pushback that we were having and people telling us it was an impossible task. Well, we've done it. Uh, we've done it with the cooperation of the agencies that we're regulating. And I have to give a lot of credit to them for stepping up and, and um, and carrying out the tasks that they have at great cost. 
to be able to uh, clean up the loading to the delta that we, that we had in the past. So thank you for reminding me to talk about that. Any further comments? Yeah, Dr. Longley, I, I wanted to comment on the uh, cannabis program. I remember when it first got started and it was trying to get its footing. There was no money. And it seems now that it's definitely moving forward and uh, the work the staff is doing on it uh, is great. I mean, uh, I, I heard uh, Patrick mention that it was 191 enrollments. And by the time the two months went by with the requirements that are put on by the state board, it went up to 444. So it's like this program has been here all the time, but I remember when it was in its infancy stages and the headaches that you guys were having to try to, you know, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Clint and his staff to try to get a handle on it. So a kudos for moving this program along and, and all of the other programs. Uh, you know, I think you, you, the staff does a tremendous job. You, you did a great job. I was waiting for you to take some water, Patrick, but you never did. But uh, to spew out all of these 18, 19 programs that are under your uh, purview and the quality work that your staff does, it's commendable. And every year it's good to hear the work that's being done. And we really do appreciate all of the work that the staff does on, on uh, behalf of a uh, quality water in our region. So thank you very much. I, I, I thank you for saying that. You know, it, it is really meaningful when you make those comments. It, it does get back to staff and, and they do um, enjoy feeling appreciated by, by you um, when they do their work. And I, I will add, I think one of the interesting things about this presentation is um, um, I, I, I didn't mention the pandemic too much. You know, we, we, we really did a lot of, all of this work was done remotely. You know, staff managing challenges with child care and managing challenges with pandemic responses and closures and things like that. It, it's extraordinary uh, how dedicated our staff are to the mission um, that I could give this presentation almost as if there wasn't a pandemic in effect. You know, they, they really did their, their work and, and got so much done, uh, even, even with everything going on in the world. Thank you, Patrick, and thank the staff for their efforts. Any further comments by board members? I'll move on then and uh, ask uh, Bruce Hodeschult if he desires to comment on, on the report. Yeah, excellent report, Patrick. I, I don't envy you having to condense that six to seven hours of, uh, of uh, reports from uh, each of the 19 departments into a really um, you know, comprehensive uh, report that also is uh, you know, concise. Um, you know, there is a lot of water quality monitoring that goes on for drinking water, for environmental health. And I don't know uh, to the extent that um, the regional board has thought about partnering, much like you saw in the presentation earlier with the partnering with the UC, uh, partnering with uh, agencies, whether, you know, as, as most of you know, I'm the vice mayor for the city of Roseville. We do a lot of water quality monitoring there or, you know, departments of environmental health that have long histories um, of, uh, of doing uh, water quality monitoring for a variety of constituents. And I don't know if there's opportunities there, not, and I'm speaking about the Irrigated Lands Program, but beyond, right? To, um, to sort of focus uh, and streamline, you know, your, your program, because there has been a lot of work that's been going on for, you know, uh, you look at Butte County, there and uh, their uh, Department of Water Resources has been doing, groundwater quality uh, monitoring for 18 years. So I uh, just wanted to, don't, don't need a direct answer, but I think, you know, as part of managing the uh, enormous workload and getting empirical data that helps you um, with a program, I was just wondering how you, you look at those programs uh, that are, those, those agencies that are out there doing it already and um, kind of partner up with them to uh, manage the uh, water quality programs. I hope that made sense. It made sense in my head. And you know, I, I, I think the, the answer is we, we do that. <clears throat> there is a, um, 
uh, kind of one of the big data hubs, uh, for lack of a better term, is the uh, California Environmental Data Exchange Network, um, which is kind of really an aggregate data source that's used to develop information for our uh, integrated report, which is kind of the, the health status of many of our water bodies. And you mentioned we actually kind of have multiple integrated reports going on at the same time. Um, that actually integrates data from not just, you know, drinking water monitoring of surface waters, um, but also a lot of information coming in from, from tribes and from uh, nonprofits and other kind of environmental associations. And I think we've been working really hard with the state board uh, to try and make it uh, so that we have water quality monitoring web portals that are accessible and transparent for everybody. And, and that, you know, if we if you pass the data standards and we've been look, working really hard at making the data standards the same so that an organization that is doing water quality monitoring under a separate permit uh, can ingest or can, can have their data uploaded and ingested into, into uh, entities like CEDIN. Unfortunately, a lot of our data on permits or particularly MPDS permits is pretty much called out in, in federal law and state law. Uh, we have other instances, abandoned mines are a good one, um, where, and CV salts for that matter, where a lot of the data that we need is not data that other people are really collecting. We try to fit, we have to fill an awful, awful lot of niches, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not downplaying which what you say uh, at all, Bruce. We need to, we need to have economy where we can get economy. We don't want to be the case that I heard of on the, a colleague of mine told about sampling on a particular point on on the San Joaquin River, and two other groups are standing behind them, wait for them to get out of the way so they can go take their samples. You do you want to you want to avoid those kinds of situations, and. Um, find ways to cooperate when, when it exists, that people are uh, sampling and analyzing to the standards that meet your requirements. Uh, uh, if you find those situations, uh, you, you can really at times find economy. Well, Dr. Longley, kudos to your staff because we did find a couple situations in the Upper Feather River where the swamp uh, program was monitoring the exact same site as the yeah. Irrigation Lands program. And we were able to adjust our monitoring in the program. And so I want to want acknowledge to, that. So you don't want to duplicate. That's, that's, yeah. that's a waste of money and time. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Long. Thank you. And the other thing um, I'd like to just add to this, talking about CV salts, and you know this, Bruce, down the road, a lot of money is going to have to be spent um, on taking salt out of water and moving it somewhere. And the phase two study that, that we got from S salts uh, gave us some idea, taste of, of what that's gonna cost. It's a horrendous cost. Um, I tend to believe that um, maybe we, we need to be looking at an in-valley solution as much as possible. Certainly source control is part of that, whatever way you go. But beyond that, uh, when you do get salt in water, uh, how, how do you manage it? Are there other things to do? Um, there's some good research going on now in that area. And towards that end, uh, I've been working with UC Davis and we are funded and then money's coming through UC Davis uh, by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we were in the first steps of establishing a um, center of excellence for salinity management encompassing the Southwest. We got about four or five states in this thing now that gives us more senators and, and Congress people. Um, and with Jenny going to uh, USDA, uh, I think we need to push this. This will allow us to use other sources of money and, and develop mechanisms for managing salts that are um, applicable, not only in California, but elsewhere in the Southwest. So um, I think we need to look at, uh, at, at partnerships like this, where they are, uh, and speaking as a regional board member, where they can serve our purposes, because we have very unique purposes at times that others maybe are not able to service. But uh, certainly, I think this Center of Excellence gives us an opportunity to move forward. And 
if it works, I think we maybe need to look at, um, are there other areas? I go back to mining because I, I just think, um, I've been involved with the mines for a long time, uh, abandoned mines, and I, th I have to think that there's other solutions that, that we might be able to incorporate if we get the, if, if we get the science that really validates these methods and, and shows that we can do them in an economical manner. Thank you. Any further comments? Well, Patrick, I thank you for a very interesting uh, report. And really, I can only add to that. Um, I need to thank the uh, board staff who've been involved in, in carrying out all of this work under very unique circumstances. And uh, we're looking for next year's report. So with that said, unless... Um, I think we have a, a brief closed session, about 15, yes. 20 minutes. And yes. And we need to sign out and go to another, um, if I'm not mistaken, another uh, URL. Yes, Chair Longley, we have another uh, Zoom meeting specifically for the closed session. Right. Before we leave, however, I do need to announce the closed session item, which is item F under our closed session list, the Valley Water Management Company litigation. Good, and after we finish, we'll come back to this site, you and I, and we will report on the closed session. Yeah, Dr. Longley, before we go, I'd just like to, I don't know if Mindy is gonna be on the, uh, on the uh, meeting after, but I just wanted to acknowledge her and thank her for all the work that she's doing with us. I know our previous executive assistant, we got abbreviated minutes, we get uh, detailed minutes. And so uh, every now and then we might, there might be something that uh, is caught there, but. Uh, I want to thank her for her being very prompt in her response to the, to the board and the detailed work that she does for us. It, 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 it helps us to review, go back and look at what we've done. And I really want to acknowledge her. I don't know, has she been here a year yet? Have you been here a year yet, Mindy? Um, I just hit six months, actually. Six okay, well, months. That's, <laughs> it so probably that's seems why, like a year. <laughs> that's why I want to acknowledge you, because you've been here for a short period of time and also during the pandemic, but you're doing an excellent job for us. And uh, we're glad to definitely have you and the work that you do. Thank you so much. Mindy, I have, so to echo, much. Uh, I have to echo Denise's uh, comments. Thank you for what you do. Okay, Thank board you. members uh, and, and staff, I'll see you on the other side in just a couple of minutes. Shall I list when you'll return? Can you give us send us the email for the for the connection to the closed session? Yes, I can resend it out right now to everyone. Just give Thank me one you. second. Thank you. You're welcome.
Yep. Nope, I did. Hi, Patrick. Bob's back. There we go. Sorry about that. I think you can unmute now, Carl. Finally. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Gene did all the hard work. I supervised. Bob just doing it to harass me. Uh, very good. The uh, board, uh, the Central Valley uh, Water Quality Control Board, met in closed session to discuss an item that uh, in which they have been involved in litigation with another party. Um, this was an information item only. No action was taken by the board. Uh, the uh, meeting is now uh, closed and the board will meet again for the 577th board meeting on October 14th in Chico and the following day in um, Redding, California for, for the Chico meeting is a tour. The next day is a formal board meeting discussing items on the agenda. And um, there can be changes based upon what happens with the COVID scene. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. And thank you, Patrick. And thank you, staff and board members for the for very productive board meeting. All right, thanks so much. Take care till next Bye. time. JJ, I've got a moment now. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs> we'll leave this one just because it's up for recording. Yeah. <laughs>